You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. The Center Steer Podcast, a Land Rover podcast by Land Rover owners. Welcome to the Center Steer Podcast, the only Land Rover podcast on the planet. This is show number 54 for September 2017. I know we're recording in October, but it's worth the wait. This is a podcast by, for, and about Land Rover owners. Visit our website, centersteer.com, to listen to previous shows and for show notes, which have links to stories discussed in today's show. We're part of the 4x4 Radio Network, and I invite you to check out other the other shows at 4x4radionetwork.com. Uh, thanks for your comments, follows, and likes on Facebook, Twitter, and email. Just got a, a message, actually, just before we record the show. We'll talk about it in a minute. And special thanks to our Patreon subscribers. You want to visit patreon.com slash centersteer for all the details on how to make a monthly contribution. The show is now available on TuneIn, and you can now tell Alexa, Alexa, play the Center Steer podcast. Think we triggered anybody? Alexa, dim the lights. <laughs> <laughs> and my favorite, Alexa, buy a galvanized chassis. I'm your host, John Costage, and joining me uh, via Skype from Western Pennsylvania is Harold, and from Vermont is Morgan. Say hi, gentlemen. Hi, gentlemen. Hi, gentlemen. <laughs> I thought I'd change it up <laughs> on you. <laughs> the weather, uh, I haven't talked about the weather. Uh, the weather is uh, perfect here in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, it is, uh, I think, currently probably about 60 degrees. It's a, it's a, ha, Autumn has sprung. Or unsprung, and it's perfect. The weather weather is autumnal. It is perfectly autumnal, I'd like to to mention. Or maybe optimally autumnal. Ooh, (laughs) optimally autumnal. So Tom messaged us right before the show that the show sounds uh, metallic and compressed. I just want to talk about that for a few minutes because I think it's important, and it's something we've been working on for a while. And Tom is also in Norway. So hi, Tom, in Norway. We have a Norwegian listener. Excellent. Yes. I don't know if he was listening to just the last show or if this was, you know, uh, like the last year or maybe from the very beginning. Uh, hopefully it wasn't in the very beginning because uh, hopefully we fixed those problems. But if, especially if it was the last show, I think I know what's going on and I think we should talk about it for a few minutes uh, to, to explain to our listeners. It couldn't be the first few episodes because he wouldn't have even heard those. That was when we were having the low volume problem. Yeah. Right. Those those days were difficult. Yeah. The difficult days in the podcast. We've we've, we've come a long way. We have. So there is but a yeah, there's... there is a limit uh, on our web host to 65 megabytes that we can save a file, and that's for anything: pictures, you know, fi- uh, text documents, or in this case, uh, MP3 files, which is what the podcast is done in. And that seems there seems to be a limit. To reach to get to that limit at a good audio quality, uh, which is like ninety, I think ninety six bit, a uh, ninety six kilobit rate, or is it just bit rate? That's uh, that's about just under two hours. And lately, <laughs> even though we try to hold it the show to maybe under two hours, sometimes we go long. There's good content, at least I think there is, and we go longer than two hours. And so then when that happens. I need to reduce the bit rate down, and I think that's probably what makes it sound metallic and you know not, not doesn't sound good, and maybe sound compressed, which would make sense. Yeah, that's that's definitely a big factor. There's a couple other factors. One of it being that uh, you know we're still using the MP3 format. There are some nicer formats out there now, which can give you even better audio quality with a lower bit rate or the same was- bit rate. I was going to suggest that the MP3 is not really a very efficient file format anymore. There are others that, yeah, they're much. They're, they end up being smaller file sizes and better quality. Right, but you know, MP3 is still the standard that's going to work everywhere. Um, true. So that's true. sort of why we, I think, we've stuck with it until now. Right. Um, besides that, we're also recording much of our episodes over Skype these days which means that the quality that we're starting with for at least some of us, so John's in studio, he's probably got great quality for his mic. When Harold is in studio, same quality. I am always over Skype, so it's never going to be the same quality that you guys are. Um, So that's another factor of it. And especially when we we have guests call in over Skype as well. And then for... Yeah, the, the Skype gets pretty busy when we're all using it. It does. And then, you know, the last thing that that comes into play is that, you know, like last month we and and this month, too, 
we have some people recording on on site at events and in those situations it's hard for us to know what the end user or what the correspondent is using to record the audio and what quality that's in generally it's going to be a pretty good quality but it might not be the best mic yes so. and i think overall i think it does has it does have to do with the length of time and then the bit rate ultimately i think is the issue but yeah those other issues are certainly you know the the source material is very important as to the you know informing the overall quality i assure you we're going to look into this i th- and I want to get some more information from Tom, exactly what he was talking about. And again, he messaged us literally like about an hour before we started the show. And uh, I suspect it might we, this might we might have to is look at a hosting plan which allows us to upload files more than sixty five megabytes. I think that may be the answer. So that will be something we'll investigate. Yeah, and thank you for the feedback. And you know, hopefully, all of our listeners won't mind that we start sending out files that are larger than 65 megabytes because <laughs> sure. it will mean we can keep going and going and going because we don't like to shut up we, we, i think we just can't all right so thanks tom and uh we'll i said we'll, we'll look into that I, and see if we can't uh fix figure that out. although i should say also just thought of this too uh thanks to pax because i the pax is certainly you know he volunteers to help make the show sound better and i think that certainly is true and hopefully that's not uh whatever issues that uh, tom has heard are not in uh, not as a result of any of the changes that pax has put into play uh, i'm hoping that's not the problem I'm, i assume it's going to be this file size issue yeah i don't believe that 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 is part of the issue overall he has greatly increased the uh the quality of our episodes indeed indeed and and one of the reasons thank him enough for that uh absolutely i I bought him a beer come on i bought him a beer perfect (laughs) and a reason one of the other reasons wow he's really cashing in the big paycheck (laughs) he is absolutely and one of the other reasons i wanted to bring this up on the show and talk about it a little more at length is it may also help other podcasters who are trying to get into the field and uh and these are kind of the issues that we've encountered and over the what are we on year four now i uh, see how, how long we've been doing this i forget well, how much time 54 episodes would be 4.5 years so four yep. four We're and a half now. years four and, and a half we've been struggling uh, at different times in different ways with audio so that's been our big our big issue all right and remember we we started with a goal of 45 minute minute episodes so <laughs> yeah did, did we ever ever keep it that short ever uh, I think for I think there was one time we had a guest and it was less than forty five minutes. I think just one guest though. For, for the guest segment, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I know everyone has been asking and thinking about my Continental Overland trip, and I have to tell you that it's been postponed. So the defender's not ready. It's getting closer though but the optimal travel window here around north america is closing i don't really want to fight with snow and and excessively cold uh, up in the north so this is but but this is going to give me an opportunity to attend some more land rover events next year with the defender along all of course in service of the podcast so i just i'll just need to work around my my uh my working schedule and then following that extended shakedown period i guess if you want to call it that i will then finally be able to take my continental overland trip Probably when I'm 55 in 2022. Well, it's uh, I, I think you're right to not try to drive north at this time of year. We've already had our first frost here in Vermont. And I looked at Fairbanks. It was like 48 degrees Fahrenheit in the middle of the day. And I'm like, uh, you know, I don't mind the well, cold. Hey, hey, as long as there's still a plus out front. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, the, the thing about it is, is, you know, I'm I'm hustling trying to get this thing done. But my, my big concern is I'm going to have your truck done. I'm going to be tightening last bolt as you're throwing your bags in and leaving. You know, that's just no way to send you off on a cross country. No, no. And I, I think this uh, new approach, Harold, is going to be better. And we can do some shakedown, little shakedown cruises and you know, do shorter, shorter trips, you know, shorter duration and then. Then it work up to a larger trip. Mm, maybe I can sleep at night again then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get into the news, shall we? First up, as we uh, usually do, we'll talk about Land Rover sales. And uh, globally, they were wonderful. For uh, August, again, I know we're in October now, but this we're talking about August sales. Uh, we'll talk about September sales later in the month. But they were up, uh, JLR, uh, both of them together, were up in August 4.3% in sales. Retail sales were up 29.9% year-on-year in China, up 2%. That's a big bump. 
that's huge. Uh, they were up 2% in North America, but they were down 11.7% in the UK, down 9.4% uh, in Europe, and down 5.4% in other overseas markets. I'm air quoting. So I assume that's Africa, South America, probably other parts of Asia. Australia. Uh, Was that one of them? Oh, that probably would be Australia then too. Yeah. Because yeah. they don't call that out. Uh, so, uh, you know, so if it, a good, just to keep in your head, the good part of the sales, then the, the increase in sales, retail increase in sales was from China and, uh, and, and another, their secondary increase was in North America. Some specifics to call out. Overall, Land Rover was up 5.8% year on year globally. And that's August of 2017 compared to August of 2016. They sold 27,559 vehicles in August. And some specifics here in uh, North America, since uh, we're in North America. Specifically in North America, the Range Rover uh, was up 14%. They sold 1,236 units. No, I'm sorry. They sold 1,409 units compared to 1,236 units uh, in August. And then the uh, the Velar just came out. They sold 413 units. And the Disco Sport uh, was up 17% in August. So things are looking good. So things are good. Uh, for Land Rover in North America, and as, of course, you know, they're very good in China, but the rest of the world uh, not doing as well. Uh, for Jaguar in North America, they did have a decrease in August, a uh, 6% decrease in uh, in the month, but over for the year, though, they're still up uh, 52%. <laughs> All having... You know, the one thing to keep in mind is that August tends to be a pretty slow month car sales-wise, so... At least in, in this country and maybe some others, and that may account for some of the, the disparity. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's usually what, in the, in at least in the U U.S., it's the traditional kind of quiet time while they're retooling the the uh, car manufacturers, retooling the lines for the new model year, and then they start producing those models in September and October. They get them out. Right. Start. So they're sort of tapering off the inventory of the last year's, uh, previous year's uh, production, and they're tooling up for the next model. And, of course, people people are, are waiting to see what the new ones are going to be, so maybe they're holding out for the new one that's coming, and they're not, not going to buy last year's model, at least not for another couple of months till they go on super sales to clear them out. Yeah, and most people are focusing their spending on back to school season kind of stuff. Right, I was going to say that. Yeah, too. And, and, and people are are not buying cars as much because they have other things to worry about. Yeah, but doesn't your daughter or son going to college need a need a new uh, Evoke? <laughs> maybe an old. Maybe you get <laughs> maybe. a new Evoke. Oh, and okay. The kid gets whatever you had and gets before. The old, gets yeah, the old one. I think the kid gets whatever you give them, <laughs> and, and that's the way it should be. Whatever you got left. So that's sales for uh, August of 2017. Uh, along the same business front, in some business news, I thought this was really interesting. Land Rover, JLR generally, but Land Rover hired a person for an IT job in, in Coventry, and they used a new an app which challenged the person. You, uh, you It was their application, really. So it was kind of a game with a challenge built into it called Gorillas, if anything got the name right. And they teamed up with a, with a company, and the first part of the game teaches players how to assemble the JAG iPACE. The second and more demanding part focuses on cracking a code in an alternate reality game format. They had 41,000 people <laughs> attempt the game, or I guess the, the challenge, of which 500 cracked the code. And as a result, a gentleman, 23-year-old gentleman named Daniel Dunkley, got a job. And he's now uh, he works uh, he's a he's a I think a developer software uh, developer coder for uh, JLR as a result. That's some yeah, serious it's... selection when you think about it. You know, one of forty one thousand. Yeah, and and part of it is that it's an interesting way to test people's skills without necessarily relying on a traditional interview process and traditional education. Um, so I think this person who won was self-educated in, in software development. So it's nice to yeah. to be able to test that in a different way. Certainly does get rid of the test anxiety factor. Yeah, definitely. And it's it's somewhat akin to some of Google's practices. They've always had, you know, the yeah. billboards and various things where they just try to get people to to figure out some special test. It certainly to get beats them interested the... and see how how talented they really are 
It certainly beats the 360 review process that some uh, interviews are now, where you go in for a whole day and you know, and you get interviewed and interviewed and interviewed and interviewed, and then they bring in another group of people. Yep. Uh, JLR is expanding its use of recycled aluminum in car bodies. So they have a $2 million project called Reality. It's a three-year project is intended uh, to result in a closed-loop aluminum recycling program, uh, one that will see the aluminum from end-of-life vehicles used directly in the manufacture of high-performance product forms for new vehicle bodies. Oh, Reality is a recycled aluminum car. It's a project that allowed uh, JLR to reuse over 75,000 tons of aluminum scrap. Yeah, so it sounds like they they implemented the first stage of that a few years ago. Um, so they're they're you know capturing currently capturing all their their manufacturing waste and reusing that, but now they're going to move into using aluminum from actually produced vehicles, production vehicles. Yeah, which I mean it gets done. I mean that's why why we have have junkyards with big crushers and and those cars get crushed and sent back and melted down. And so it's been going on for decades, but aluminum is a little trickier to recycle than than steel. Um, and, and of course when you do you, you it's always kind of hard to move back up to the same level of refinement that you started with, but but it's it's cool that they're making a bigger focus and they're talking about it. Yeah. And, and, uh, aluminum is a very expensive and resource process, specifically expensive process to, to mine and then convert to aluminum from ore. Um, right. so I think the stats are something like 95% more efficient to recycle it. But like you said, yeah, it's, you, it's hard to maintain the same quality level. So that's why they're obviously using it to make forms when they're recycling from a, a production vehicle as opposed to trying to actually make something like structural aluminum for the frame or something like that. We talked in the last uh, few months about a gentleman named Jim Ratcliffe in the UK who was looking to build the Defender again the way we know it, but it looks like Land Rover uh, doesn't want him to, and they're moving to stop that by... Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> Surprise. Yes. Uh, yeah, because su people would buy it, and they wouldn't wouldn't buy Jerry's Defender. <laughs> I'm surprised it's taken him this long, but the, uh, and also surprised that the, the measures they're taking they didn't hadn't already done, which is to trademark the name, although maybe the Defender had already been trademarked, but they were definitely looking to they're looking to trademark the design of the Defender from the very first series car back in the 48 all the way up to the latest Defender. Um, so hopefully those efforts, you know, I think yeah, they'll, they'll you'd be have to trademark, uh, you know, the silhouette and, and every curve and every feature uh, because it's, it's pretty easy to make stuff that looks like a Defender. And as long as you don't call it that, you're OK. We've seen how that works in in China already. They, exactly. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, well, and honestly, there's, their laws there's are things like the fashion industry where you can't copyright designs. So I'm, that's still something you can trademark in, in automotive design at this, at this time. But who knows how long that will last. So moving on, AutoWeek had an article called How Jaguar and Land Rover Maintain Separate Identities. As you're not surprised, and we've talked about this for a number, uh, number of months, actually, you know, the... Jaguar uh, F-Pace is based uh, on the same frame as the Velar. There's some you know, subtle differences, but effectively they're on the same platform. And my opinion on that matter is well known. I, I don't know what that would be. I, I don't think... Uh, what, what happens if we have new listeners to the podcast, Harold? I, I, I love it. I think it's the most wonderful <laughs> idea they've ever had. What if they also can't detect sarcasm, though? <laughs> uh, it's true. They can't see the blinking light. <laughs> Yeah, in case you have not been listening, in case you've been under a rock and someone just handed you a, a sticker for this podcast, and this is the first time you've ever heard me chime in on the subject, my belief, which comes as no surprise to those who have been listening, is that Jaguar has absolutely no business building SUVs of any type. Except for Finbar McFall, who is a, I think he's the designer. Look, I just lost his name or lost his title. I think he's a JLR design guru. Um, is that just Jerry McGovern using a screen name? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I can't find his title. It went away in this article. But he says. It's a palindrome. 
<laughs> I don't know if I can read the article. <laughs> there now. you go. I don't know if I can read this article now. You know, the two brand share p- platform, McFall, says that they have several differences in design and engineering to separate them. The F Pace has 8.4 inches of ground clearance compared to the V6 equipped Velar's 9.9 inch. Approach and departure angles are also different. In a world where cars are becoming more similar, it's important to have real differences. All right, so I'm just going to go out and buy a Defender. I'm going to saw two inches off the spring, so the ride height is two inches lower. It's a different vehicle. It can have a different brand on it. They're completely different. It'll be as sporty as a Jaguar. And you'll like it. This applies to electrification, too. It will be appealing. JLR recently announced their intention to offer electric option in every vehicle. But how electricity will supplant combustion engines can vary greatly. Quote, you can imagine in a Jaguar, the electrification in a performance is a performance reality, and that torque being instantly available, transitioning into acceleration. The battery is sitting low in the vehicle, giving a low center of gravity, inherently good dynamics, unquote. He added, quote, electrification in a Land Rover and having the ability to inf- infinitely manipulate the torque and instantly manipulate it, well, that's just perfect in an, in an off-road environment. I do agree with that. All right, but that really doesn't say a lot because right. I mean, he- the electric vehicle technology can be optimized for either, and, and they really do lend themselves well to either use. So I, it doesn't create two separate identities. Yeah, yeah, yes, it does, Harold. You're not, what you're missing here is that one will have the badge that says Jaguar, and the other vehicle will have the badge that says Land Rover. Yeah, one will have a growler on it. The other will have an oval. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, that makes them completely different. <laughs> I stand corrected. All right, then. Well, that's and good. They, they will install different firmware in their software, and then that'll do it. Okay. <laughs> Moving to another story, and this is more general, but we have been talking about this for the past couple uh, months because it's going to inform the future of uh, Land Rover, Jaguar, and really every car maker on the planet. Uh, China is looking to is looks at plans to ban petrol and diesel cars. This is from the, uh, the from the BBC actually. Uh, China, the world. I think a lot of this is good to read because there's some really good information in here. China, the world's biggest car market, plans to ban the production and sale of diesel and petrol cars and vans. Notice it doesn't say new. It says just ban the, the, the production and sale of, uh, which I think is very interesting. The country's uh, vice minister of industry has started that uh, relevant research, it has started relevant research, but has not yet decided when the ban would come into force. Uh, of course, they know it's going to have a profound change on the industry. China made 28 million cars last year, almost a third of the global total. As we've talked about before, the UK and France have already announced plans to ban these new diesel and petrol vehicles by 2040. Chinese uh, owned car maker Volvo uh, said in July that all new models would have an electric motor starting in 2019. Geely, Volvo's uh, Chinese owner, aims to sell 1 million electric vehicles uh, by 2025. And other car firms, uh, Renault, Nissan, Ford, and General Motors are all working to develop electric cars in China. Uh, China wants electric battery cars and plug-in hybrids to account for at least one-fifth of its vehicle sales by 2025. The proposal would require 8% of automakers' sales to be battery electric or plug-in hybrids by next year, rising to 12% in 2020. I'm going to read that again. This, the proposal would require 8% of automaker sales to be battery electric or plug-in hybrids by next year, then they would increase that to 12% in 2020. So they're, they're making a push, real significant that is push. A, that's a big push to go to yeah. go from 0 to 8% in one year. So, well, do we know what percentage it is right now? I well, mean, I mean, yeah, in I terms of it is man- mandatory close. minimum of 0 is what I'm saying. Right, yes. That's, that's a big threshold to step in with. And for yep. making 28 million cars in a year, you know, 8%, that's a lot of cars. Uh, you know, that's... And you know, and, right. and as we've started, you know, we talk about sales every month, and I think people wonder, you know, maybe why we do that. Well, that's it's important, actually, especially on a story like this, when you see that that China is the largest manufacturer of vehicles on the on the planet, and and the largest consumer too. Thank you. Good point. Largest consumer and uh, Land Rover JLR, their sales were up almost thirty percent in one month, just in China alone. 
So, you know, they're going to, so they have to, they have to focus on what China is doing or what, what requires them to do as they start to produce cars in the future. Right. And, and uh, you know, China being the, the world's number one market. And then, you know, to add on to this, next year they're talking about uh, North America's number one market, which is California, looking at, at the same legislation. I, I think perhaps because California is worried that China is going to be outgreening them soon. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the other the other aspect of this is that China is still the biggest producer of green technologies and lithium ion batteries and all of that that stuff. Kind of uh, ironic given how badly they pollute the sky in most of their big cities. <laughs> well, and that's that's one yep. of the reasons why they're doing this Harold is to reduce that well, pollution. Well, of course and, and of course it is. It's nice to see them actually stepping up. But... Yeah, they're getting yep. they're trying to get ahead of all of all of those problems whereas you know, we did that here in Pittsburgh by, well, let, actually letting the Japanese produce steel so that the industries here died. Anyway, side note. But now, so so China, with China looking to ban, and pretty much this, I think that's a done deal from the way I read that article. I think that's, what, five countries now? We have the U.K., France, Norway, uh, China. Isn't there a fifth one? Am I missing a fifth country? California. I well, no, no, no. <laughs> the republic thereof. Yes. <laughs> the republic. I, I be, actually, did we not uh, start a... They'll be number six. There is a fifth country. I don't remember what it, what it is, though. Didn't we? I thought we started a list. Uh, banning, here we go. No, I did. I did in our uh, wonder list. I started a list. Norway to completely ban petrol power cars by 2025. German government votes to ban internal combustion engines by 2030. India going electric only, goal of no diesel gas by 2030. France to ban sale of petrol and diesel by 2040. Britain to ban new diesel and gas cars by 2040. So actually China would then be number China's number six. six. Yeah. So just to recap, China, Norway, Germany, India, France, and Britain are on the list. So as uh, you know, which is interesting because you know it takes us into the discussion of you know Land, Land Rover well Land Rover and Jaguar really made a big splash with uh, this past month about they're going to they're going to have an electric version of, of all their vehicles available by 2020 and and then they came out with that E-type that was all electric the an old E-type that was all electric and everyone's like ooh look it's exciting look what they're doing and I all I could say to myself and I think I even tweeted this out was they have to this is why they have to all these countries are well, significant countries. Not are, only that, yeah. but your most iconic vehicle is called the E-Type. You've got to make it electric. <laughs> Absolutely. E stands for electric. <laughs> really? So, <laughs> it does now. Uh, but so, they, they did some interesting things with that electrified E-Type, though, too. Sort of going above and beyond. They... they they specifically converted it to maintain the same, you know, weight ratios and, well, they boosted the acceleration by about a second. So it's like zero to 60 is 5.5 seconds now. Um, but overall, they kept everything fairly stock looking, fairly stock balanced and, and weight ratios and everything. So it, it performs pretty much like the original and the electric engine is in, is in the original placement of the what was it inline six in that originally? Yes. Um, but yeah, so that they went a little above and beyond, and it it still looks like a classic E type, and I bet it's a hell of a lot of fun to drive. Oh, well, it's probably a lot more well, fun to drive. That doesn't say much because every E type is fun to drive. They did stick a nice uh, touchscreen. Uh, display in the middle there, so you and I think also for the uh, gauges too, they're replaced by by TF, TFT displays. The, the question is, did they change the spelling of it to the little e type? <laughs> well, that, <laughs> Harold, that's how you know that when you're out and about and you see another and you see another uh, Jaguar, how you know it's an electric one because if it says e type, then it's obviously electric. No, okay, not buying it unless you can spell smell the unleaded gasoline. <laughs> Uh, but uh, so yeah, they came out with that, and then also uh, they're now they've a Jaguar, excuse me, Land Rover announced that a plug-in hybrid Range Rover and Sport are coming in 2018. So starting of March of next year, uh, they're going to have uh, the plug-in hybrid. What did I say? Also a uh, yeah plug a plug-in version, a PHEV, which is plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. 
they will be available. Uh, Spaeth announced that at the uh, Frankfurt Auto Show. Uh, unlike the current Range Rover Hybrid, which uses a diesel engine, the new Range Rover will be powered by an electric powertrain paired to the brand's Ingenium 2-liter four-cylinder gasoline engine. This will propel the plug-in hybrid model to 30 miles of electric-only power. Of course, with uh, no, no. fuel economy. Why, why don't they continue to use the Ingenium diesel to run the hybrid power plant? That I don't understand. It'd be even more efficient yet. Uh, but I think emissions. Uh, yeah, the, the, the thing is, you're running at a much more constant speed and load when you're just using that engine to recharge the battery. So at that point, it becomes much easier to control your emissions. Right. I think the difference here, what they're saying is they're switching from the diesel engine being the, the powertrain with probably an electric helper of some type to having an electric drivetrain that is powered by... Well, I understand that, uh, yes, but I would yeah, use yeah. the diesel to, to to run the generator. But uh, maybe oh, they're agree. doing it. Maybe they're doing it for cost containment. It because the be. gasoline engine is cheaper, right? But uh, it's it's nowhere near as cool as a, as a diesel powered. Oh, I yeah, I, yeah. I would much rather have the diesel electric hybrid. Well, more details on the plug-in were, are said to be coming in October. So we'll hopefully next this time next month we'll have more details on the plug-in. Cool. More company news, uh, generally. Uh, JLR is said to be scouting for luxury brand and tech company deals. So Tata has amassed uh, $6.1 billion of cash and equivalents uh, this year, or at least through the end of June. And there's some discussion that the company uh, plans to use some of that money to add products, technology, manufacturing capacity. Uh, that's according to the CFO of Tata. And there's some also further discussion that they may buy another car company to help increase that capacity. Um, there's no details yet, and uh, but that's there's some discussion about that. Uh, you know, Fiat uh, has uh, Fiat, along those lines. You know, Fiat is considering spinning off Maserati and Alfa Romeo. Volkswagen is considering getting rid of Ducati, which is the, their motorcycle brand. Uh, you know, these, none of that's well, official. Well, Volkswagen needs to raise some cash to pay for their diesel problems. $30 yeah. billion they've spent in the U.S. Yeah, exactly. Just and the like, U.S. isn't the only place they had the problem. No, they didn't. Yeah, I know in Germany they had to pay some significant, significant fines there, too. Even though was what the, they did was legal in Germany. Well, but was, they, they still lied. Well, yeah. yeah, that the lying part is is not legal, but it is legal to turn off your emissions controls in Germany in in the EU. Uh, Interesting. Probably not anymore. <laughs> uh, well, they they actually the Germans are uh, last I read they were they were enacting legislation that that superseded the EU ruling on that matter because in, in the EU it was legal to turn it off if you could demonstrate some reason why it was important for the longevity of the engine. Uh, or some other significant reason why you needed to do that, and then it was okay. Interesting. So uh, there's a, there's internal uh, company discussions apparently going on within uh, JLR and Tata about uh, buying another brand to diversify the range uh, and possibly even another luxury mark. So we'll keep an eye out on that if that happens. I I don't know. I guess my thought on that is why, and you know, if you're going to buy anything, why not buy a non-luxury brand and sell? You know, if you're the Cadillac, why not buy something that would you so say you can sell Chevrolets? That's, that's or important. or invest in some tech companies that are going to make your your primary products better. Yeah. You know, give yourself breadth instead of just depth. Yeah. And now to some specific vehicle news, and I we're going to talk about uh, the Range Rover Velar is available in Australia, and I fully and freely admit that we're talking about this because we have uh, two Australian listeners that I know of, uh, one who's a Patreon subscriber, so this is special. If you're not an Australian, you can turn off the show. No, excuse me, skip ahead. Don't turn off the show. You can skip ahead <laughs> in the show by, I don't know, three or four hours, and then we'll be done. <clears throat> And then we'll be done with uh, Australian pricing. It's like Australian rules football, isn't it? Australian pricing. Uh, the footy. So the Avoc. No. Sorry, I was looking at Avoc in here. The five-seat Velar will be available in Australia for 70662 Australian dollars. That will have the following models available. Standard, S, SE, or HSE. 
which along with the first edition version, they have every, you know, when they've come out with the first model year of the vehicle, they come out with this new first edition one, which I, I mean, having those, I'll call them four, even though I know there's a first edition, but that four models, we don't have the standard here in the U S right. We just do S S S S E and H S E or they, they do here in the U S S E H S E and then S H S E Lux or luxury, don't they? Well, the, the S E is considered the base model in, in, in the U S because we don't do, bargain SUVs for Land Rover here. Right. But I guess they do in Australia. Uh, they'll have an active locking rear diff, terrain response 2 for decent off-road ability. Uh, the towing capacity of the Vlar will be 2,500 kilograms, and it will come with the option of one of five engines. There, will, there are three diesels, two are four cylinders, one is a V6, and there are two petrols, both are four cylinder at uh, with different uh, kilo uh, not kilowatts um, kW <laughs> that's kilowatts it's kilowatts and, and yes and and m is nanometers no what's nm that's for torque that's right? newton that's a newton meter newton meter there we go different ones uh, eight speed yeah, the, the kilowatt is the metric version of horsepower yep. ah, thank you there and are 746 watts in one horsepower so one horsepower is about three quarters of a kilowatt or something like that. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. I, yeah, I'll yeah, i forget that promptly, but that's good to know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, we should just go metric and be done with it. But, uh, an eight-speed auto transmission will be standard across the line. And I know you. this was another month you thought we'd get away with uh, what did Jerry say. And we, and we've been doing that for the last couple of months and, and really didn't have anything, but that's not true here with Embedded in the Australia section of the podcast. What did Jerry say? Quote, we call the Velar the avant-garde Range Rover. It brings a new dimension of glamour, modernity, and elegance to the brand. The Range Rover Velar changes everything. Huh. You know what would change everything? You mentioned earlier, it kind of got my attention. Uh, in fact, when we were doing the show rundown, you said that the Velar was going to come with five engines. I'm thinking we need a, a, a deep-pocketed sponsor to let us build a five-engined Velar, and we can go kick ass at the truck poles. That would change <laughs> everything. That would. <laughs> uh, and thus ends the Australian segment of the podcast. So we bring you back to nor uh, regular North American, I guess, discussions. Uh, the new Ev Evoque is coming. The new what? Evoque. Did yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Damn it. I'll buy that one. <sighs> damn it. The new Evoke is coming uh, <laughs> next year, and one was successful. One was seen. Uh, the successfully seen. That's not the right word, but you know what I'm talking about. In uh, I think uh, in Arizona, uh, Land Rover has sold 600,000 units since they debuted in 2011, and now they're looking at version two or series two, I guess. And uh, one was spotted in Glendale, Arizona. There it is. And the this uh, model, uh, the company will keep the the second gen Evoque based on the same D8 architecture, which will uh, be updated in a few key points, including a slightly longer wheelbase for more rear legroom and boot space. And Is it in uh, development camo? It's partially in development the, camo. Basically, yes. only the nose. Really, swirls. Yeah. Lots of swirls. I think the uh, interesting part of this is that this is the first sighting of it on North American soil. There have been a few spotted in the UK. Yeah. Well, they usually test them around the world in different places, so this is probably the heat testing, I'm guessing. Oh, probably. Expect to see the second gen Evoque or Evoque Series 2 in late 2018 with a market launch in early 2019. Isn't that about the time of the new Defender supposed to be announced? Are they doing this? Is well, that going to be concurrent? But see, the the new Defender was supposed to be in, in 2017 and then 2018, and, and so it's a rolling target. You never know. Yeah, I can't imagine they're, one's going to uh, overshadow the other. They wouldn't They wouldn't do that. Well, but well mind you, it's only a second-gen Evoque. It's not like a big release. Uh, I think no matter what they put out, when the new Fen Defender comes, it's going to overshadow everything. It better. We hope, isn't that? That's <laughs> we think it will. Well, but the thing is, if it doesn't, there will be much discussion, and that will overshadow everything. Good point. Then, yes. Then hell, absolutely. Will be able to pay. 
One way or another, it's making a big splash. The Wilkes brothers will come out of their graves. <laughs> Quite possibly. <laughs> they will rise from the sands. All right. Land Rover Discovery SVX is an angry mountain goat on wheels. Uh, Autoblog here in the U.S. Uh, had one of the... Had, look, T tested one of the uh, SVXs. It's a five liter supercharged V8 producing 517 horsepower. How many kilome how many kilowatts is that? Uh, 461 pound feet of torque. They have a specially calibrated eight speed automatic transmission with twin speed transfer box. The driver selects gears via new pistol shifter, which provides easier off-road shifting than the rotary selector. The chassis, four-corner air suspension with long travel dampers, makes use of hydraulic active roll control for enhanced wheel articulation and body control. Uh, more ground clearance, improved angles of approach, departure, and breakover. Uh, has terrain response to the vehicle rides on forged aluminum alloy wheels. They're a Goodyear Wrangler all-terrains. Yeah, what are they? Uh, Twenty inch. Uh, yes, you're. Uh, yes, I'm. Yes, you are. They are uh, R20s. Correct. Uh, of course, all the usual train response, uh, hill descent, electronic traction control, adaptive dynamics, dynamic speed control, all terrain progress control, and electric power assisted steering. Uh, what's there for the driver to do? Off-road features. Land Rover promises exemplary waiting capability from the Discovery SVX. Hill descent, uh, in addition to hill descent, it's equipped with integrated electric rear winch for creeping down the really gnarly stuff. That's what it says. Integrated electric rear winch. All right. Winch. Uh, a roof-mounted light pod provides extra illumination. Yawn. It gets some big tires. It's in satin to tonic gray paint finish with orange accents, including orange toe eyes, black side vents, orange accents, V8 badging. Uh, it gets a unique lunar and light oyster color combination on the inside and SVX branded features, including the X logo perforations and prospective customers can register their interest with Land Rover and production begins by hand at the SVO Technical Center in 2018. You'll notice there's no price. If you have to ask, you can't <laughs> afford. But, register. You know, I'm going to be a bit controversial here because, I mean, it's a cool product. But if I had that kind of money to throw down and I wanted a high-performance midsize SUV, pains me to say it, but I would not buy this. I would keep walking, and I would go into my Jeep dealer. Continue. Jeep just came out with the Grand Cherokee Trackhawk. Not your garden variety Grand Cherokee. And mind you, it's a Grand Cherokee, so you got to look past all the Jeepiness. But when you're sitting inside, get rid of the chrome letters on the steering wheel, and there's nothing else that makes you look like you're in a Jeep when you're inside the thing. Turn the key, and you will fire up that Hellcat engine. Ooh. 707 horsepower, 645 pound-feet of torque, Whoa. driven through an 8-speed torque flight with paddle shifters, and a transfer case with um, variable torque bias and five driving modes. Is there do you have effort? to sign the waiver just like you do with the, the Hellcat? No, cap? that would be a demon. you got to buy 800 oh, it's horsepower the demon. before yeah, you yeah, have right. to sign in the presence of a notary. But you can always go out in the aftermarket and get that 707 turned up. But let me tell you what the stock 707 will do for you. Okay, so you got five driving modes, right? And so first one, obviously, is automatic. Just let the computer do the thinking for you. From there, we go to the tow mode. or I'm sorry, we'll go to snow mode first. Low traction situation, it's snowy out. It's going to deliver, I think, 70% of your torque to the front wheels. becomes basically a front-wheel drive truck for when the roads are slippery. Then you go to tow mode. It's 60% bias to the front, 40% to the rear. It tightens up all the shift mo shifts for, for added strength and, and changes the shift points for better acceleration when towing. Then there is sport mode, which is 40% front, 60% rear, um, elevated shift points for better acceleration, that sort of thing. And then... Finally, there is track mode. 70% bias to the rear, everything dialed up to 11. And if that's not enough, there is a launch control mode. No, launch control. <laughs> you turn on launch control, 
you put your left foot hard on the brake, left foot braking, you take your right foot and put it fully you know where. Skinny pedal. And then the and then the computer takes over and it starts doing all these exotic supercar things to manage the engine and get it right to where it needs to go, you know, managing all the torque and and, and it turns up the boost and all that stuff. So when you're ready, you take a deep breath and you take and you sidestep your left foot. Okay, we're already going blisteringly fast because you'll be doing 60 in 3.5 seconds. You'll reach the quarter mile in 11 and change. And if your road is long enough, just keep your right foot down and it will continue to pull you all the way to 180 miles an hour. Whoa. At which point you'll step on some huge brakes and then you want to remind yourself that you are in a big shoebox that weighs two and a half metric tons. Think about that for a minute. So don't touch the steering wheel when you slam on those brakes at 180 miles an hour. Reportedly, it's actually not bad on a track, but you don't want to do anything quickly or abruptly, definitely, because that would be stupid. But mind you, some people are going to do that. So these things are going to start showing up in the junkyards. So I'm thinking in a couple of years, I may have to look for one of these things that's been wadded up and take all the good bits out and do something fun, like the world's scariest 110. <laughs> So it is It is not a trail chicken. You know what? You're spending that kind of money, at least if I'm spending that kind of money, I'm not leaving the pavement with it. No. I'm no. sorry, but I'm not spending that kind of money on a trail hammer. No. <laughs> it's the opposite. I'm going, I'm going everywhere down the street in it, and, and I don't care if it looks like a Jeep because I'll be going too freaking fast for them to identify it anyway. <laughs> and the view from the inside is nothing but a leather-wrapped blur. So, yeah, if I had the money, that's where it would go. Sorry, sorry, Land Rover, but <laughs> you ain't there yet. And that was today. Well, that was this month's M word. <laughs> I think that was a good. Sorry, I'll, just I'll had to you. drop that. Bomb. No, it's fantastic. I love it. Oh, yeah, that's I awesome. I, 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 too bad we don't we should make that uh, make it an M word. That would have been fantastic. Land Rover, you're not there yet. Or maybe that's a show title. I'm not sure. All well, right. I'll go the. The, the opposite way. Well, not the opposite way. I'll step back to the SVX and just say that that's what the Discovery 5 should have had, right? Except well, for the, yeah. the rear that electric switch. Yeah, because the Discovery 5 did not have a V8 option like the previous Discoveries. Yeah, that's but, nice to have it return to the V8 yeah, but there's, option. There's a, there's a, so you've got to buy this special hand-built option just to get it back to where it should have been and where it was 10 years ago. But there's yeah. a, there's an overall reason for that. They have to have, don't forget, and especially in the U.S., they have to have corporate-level uh, um, cafe standards, you know, the uh, miles Corporate per average fleet eco fuel economy. Economy, right. Oh, I, so under by, I by, understand. So by not having a V8, you're a lot, then that allows you to have that, that you need. So what do they do? They have a one-off V8 that if you really want it, then you can buy it, and it's a hand and it's a hand built, so it probably doesn't get included in that cafe standards because it's not a standard model that's uh, it's available for option. So right, this this is essentially a modified, yes, Discovery Five, right, by SVO, by by the manufacturer, but it's not it's right. not a standard option vehicle. It's not a standard one that they make, at least for this country, and therefore it doesn't get rolled into those those standards, but. There, there's the reason. I mean, that's that's admit it. That's that's the reason for it. So they actually, Land Rover is doing what you want them to do, just not how you want them to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, I I do think it looks cooler than the Discovery Five because it does it does seem to make it. It doesn't. I I won't say it makes it look more like a Discovery, but it makes it look a little more like an off road vehicle. Where the Discovery oh, yeah. Five so, doesn't quite look like an off road vehicle right now. No. Makes it look more like it should. Yeah. I, right. Yeah, you, yeah. We're all in agreement on that. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. If if I had the money and I had to choose from a Land Rover Range Rover vehicle, it would probably be the SVX if I had to buy a new model of something. But yeah, it's not. You'd need plenty of money, unfortunately. Yeah, definitely. They're, if they're not listing the price. <laughs> Again. Yep. And yep. That doesn't count shipping. Yeah, taxes. Now it's it's interesting that they do do the rear winch only 
on that. Um, and usually winches are not set up for lowering. So that's a, a strange choice there in their marketing and everything. Obviously, yeah, they don't they normally have. power out under load very well. No, you have to have a special, specially designed winch, probably usually with a worm gear or something like that to, to make that work yep. correctly I, and safely. The, uh, the interesting thing is whether it'll still power in well or whether it's been totally optimized because I could see a, a good use case for when you go off the road into the ditch, you could pull yourself back out from whence you came. Right. All right, moving on to the to similar discovery, but this is a one that you can actually purchase and has a price. This is the TD6. Auto Week did a quick, uh, quick take. They call it a quick take, and on it, the, the list price is sixty six thousand nine hundred forty five dollars. Which so there's at least a price. You know what you can. Uh, you know you know what right. you're getting. Uh, it is, of course, you know, your three row uh, luxury SUV. Uh, and uh, you know that one of their highlights here was that uh, it, it has all the amenities you'd expect in a much pricier Range Rover, uh, which I think is interesting that there is that. These are in their minds; they're kind of you know similarly equipped and similarly uh, optioned and uh, similar on the inside, I suppose. And that's that's roughly the way it's always been for the discoveries. Right. They the, they're the, always the very the very first D one was called a poor man's Range Rover. So, right. Yep. But when once you got in it, it was not that different from a Range Rover. I same swear the, the D two. I swear the seats were the same between a Range Rover and a Disco. They always seemed to be the same exact seats. Well, yeah. just about every part except for the external sheet metal was the same. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yep. Okay. Literally. And this uh, discovery has a diesel V6, and uh, there is a, a reading from the article here is more than ample beyond a slight initial lag as the turbo does its thing. Even better, our tester more than more than ample. That's that's just limp. I'm sorry. Our tester returned an outstanding 27.4 miles per gallon in mostly highway driving with four people and their luggage. Uh, there is a supercharged V6 available uh, for it, uh, but they think that the refined diesel V6. Uh, isn't its element in this uh, particular, quote-unquote, budget Range Rover. Come on, make the TD V8 available. Come on. So for you still, can do I'd, it. Rather, I'd rather have the, the TD V6 than one of the four-cylinder. Four well, well yeah, because six, six is better than four, but by <laughs> my logic, eight is better than six. Yeah, I agree. And I also think that they're, you know, yeah, they're 20, what was it, 27.4 miles per gallon uh, with four passengers and their luggage. And, I mean, yeah, the mileage is good, but four passengers and their luggage does not negatively affect mileage. Don't tell anybody not on a Not on a diesel. <laughs> no. And not in a disco. Come on. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> I mean, a disco, well, too, yeah, gets and, like 13 and, uh, no matter whether there's anything in it or not. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of my point is that they could put the TD V8 in there and it would get the same mileage. Yeah. Yeah, I'd rather have the V8. Uh, when given the choice between six and eight, I always want eight. You can now drive a Land Rover Defender as we know it in North America. So you can go to one of the heritage centers that Land Rover has in North America, or at least in the U.S., for $1,200 American, $1,200 American. There's a half-day course, and a full-day program will set you back $1,500, and you, too, can drive a modern Land Rover Defender. Uh, the Her they well, have three heritage well, centers. That's an oxymoron, is it not? <laughs> yeah. You it's can not a modern one. <laughs> well, modern by what we can normally obtain here in the U.S. How's that? You can drive it. That doesn't mean you own it. Uh, and you need to go to either Carmel, California, Manchester, Vermont, or Asheville, North Carolina. So if anybody would like door-to-door -door service from, let's say, the Burlington International Airport to Manchester, Vermont, I will happily provide that service for a ride-along uh, at the uh, Land Rover Center in Manchester. Sounds like a, like a neat new, new business for you, Morgan. Right. <laughs> Va Va valet service at the Land Rover ex experience. I will happily do that. Right on. Start a new website. Get it going. Now, if only my Series 3 was running, that would be great to take somebody in a Series 3 all the way from Burlington to Manchester. 
and then have them get in a defender. It would feel quite comfortable afterwards. I tell you what, if you Up, if upgrade. you get if you get someone who wants to do that, I will personally bring up the series the the one hundred and nine series three, and you can I'll let you use it. Perfect. <laughs> oh, and that would be a good one too, because that that one's one of the harshest series tracks I've ever written, <laughs> isn't it? And and it's you have a to. bonus for me because I only have to drive it from Burlington to Manchester, and you have to drive it all the way up here. Uh, well, that's true. Oh, wait a minute, hold on. What time of year? What time of year? You have to, uh, you, but you'll have to roll the sides up, and then you got to take the door tops off. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's so pleasant <laughs> to do in November. <laughs> it doesn't make a difference. Well, it does slightly. Yeah, it does. It does actually. Yeah, it does. Because <clears throat> it, you know, it, you know, as we've said before, Series Three has climate control. Whatever that, whatever the climate is outside, that's what the climate is inside. All right, moving on to bring a trailer, and there was a touching story about a uh, 1991 Defender TDI was sold on bring a trailer. A gentleman, uh, do I have his name here? I don't know. Uh, he purchased a Defender. And then uh, fixed it up, got it back to its uh, into good graces, and made it road worthy again, and put it up for sale on Bring a Trailer. At w- which point, um, his son, who was I think eight, nine, or ten, somewhere in that vicinity, uh, you know, could s- complained and said, you know, his, his dad said, "Well, there'll be other 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 trucks, my son. You know, don't worry. Soon we'll be driving another car. I promise." And uh, I guess uh, his son got felt down like his uh, favorite pet had been taken away from him. Um, and, uh, and, and, oh, his name's Thomas. Here we go. Uh, and Thomas didn't, you know, was missing the Defender. And he then says to his dad, Daddy, the Red Defender was the best truck in the world. There isn't one like it anywhere. I wouldn't love any other Land Rover. I only loved the one that you sold. So he got back on to... Uh, bring a trailer, track down what was happening. Uh, the truck was sold, but thankfully it fell through. And he then turned to uh, the, the gentleman he sold it to, who was selling the, the truck out, talked to him and told Bill, a nice guy uh, that he is, this is in the article, patiently listened as I explained to him on the phone why I'd like to have the truck back. I cover all Bill's expenses relating to buying, shipping, and prepping the car for sale, plus a reasonable profit. Not a profit he could have had, Made, but a good profit nonetheless. To my great relief, B- Bill agreed. Well, we ended up with the Defender NA wheels, uh, Defender NA wheels, and a new bumper, uh, and it was back on its way to Oregon, where he lived. And he said he was happy to have my the truck back, and his son was back because his son had his Defender back. Lesson learned: Question: It is never too early to fall in love with a car, and when it happens, recognize and respect your child's feelings. Otherwise, you're bound to pay the price. You'll be lucky if it's only in dollars. The, the, the lesson I'm taking away from this is never sell your only Land Rover. <laughs> you need several. Then, then you don't miss it as much when you part with one of them. That's right. It's a good-looking truck, too. It was red. It had the county stripes on it. Nice-looking truck. Yeah, I, I'm not digging the county stripes. I'm not a fan of those. But, but I mean, it's sort of a, an, an 80s thing that I'm just – I'm over. Well, with the bright red and the blue stripes, there's too much contrast there. But, you know, uh, I guess in my, I'm thinking of it, when it gets patinaed, it'll look nice. So there's a okay. heartwarming story. And then following on with uh, the Land Rover and children theme, you may know there's a series of books out there from Veronica Lamond called uh, Landy. And it's about a, you know, a, a, looks like a Series 2 uh, Land Rover. And it was a farm truck and it, and she wrote some, so several children's books on it. Now it is available read out loud on YouTube, and there's a little bit of animation to it. So you too can, if you have not purchased the book, or maybe if you have purchased the book, and you uh, can listen to it for nine minutes and 44 seconds, you can listen to Landy, a classic Land Rover book for children, read out loud. I don't think Veronica does it herself. Uh, it's read by somebody else. We'll have a link in the show notes, so if you can go do that. Turns out I was so 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 she doesn't read it herself. It's someone else that reads it. Uh, I believe so. Yes. All right. So we need to get her on the show so that she can read it in her own voice Ooh. on our show. All right. Open open invitation to Veronica Lamond to come on the show and talk about Landy and read the book. I, I was checking out her website actually since you mentioned that, and she now has I think seven books around uh, uh, on this theme, including she was invited to the 
she was invited to Sully Hall and saw the Land Rovers being made, and they uh, she went through the factory tour, and she went out then and made Landy at the factory. And it looks like, actually, there's some drawings there from the picture that I see here uh, of uh, Land Rover being built. Well, well, see, there you go. There's seven books. She can read all seven of them, and then we can offer them on our, our, our podcast website as like Christmas gifts to our listeners. There we go. Yes. You know, they download the file, you know, a little, little special edition, and here's the book. Ooh. Okay. I will reach out to her, Veronica Lamond. Or if anybody and knows I, Veronica Lamond, have her get in touch with us. Love to have or her. if by chance you're already listening, Veronica, please let us know. Indeed. That'd be cool. And I fully support her method of getting them young. Kids. Hooking kids on Land Rover's young. Not quite as good as, as bringing them home from the hospital from being born in a series truck, mind you, but... True. We know people that do that. Uh, who? who our, our friend, Mr. Garcia. Oh, that's right. That's right. Mark, yes. Mark did bring his daughter home in his, in the seri- his series 3, 2, 2A. Two series 3, yeah. Series three. 3. Series 3. That's right. Perfect. Yes. Very suitable. Indeed, indeed. All right, well, that's it the new... It was 40 below when I was brought home from the hospital, so I'm glad that wasn't in a series Land Rover. Do you know what you were brought home in? It was probably a Datsun wagon, actually. It wasn't a Volvo? I'm not... It wasn't a Volvo. <laughs> Actually, I, wow, good question. I, that's that's a good one. I like that. What car were you brought? This is a good survey to our listeners. What car were you brought home <laughs> yeah. from from being born in? I don't even know. I'm not sure. I have to ask. I'm gonna have to ask my mother what what was my first vehicle ride in? Because I was born. In a I, I I'd hazard a guess that I was brought home in a in well, no, maybe not. They might not have had that car yet. Huh. Okay. Well, what, no. What were you guessing? It, well, I was gonna. Uh, it would be a big Mopar station wagon of some sort, definitely. As my dad it, drove those, and my mom always had a little car. But I suspect if my dad was bringing her home from the hospital, it'd be in in his big old bruiser. Yeah, I'll have to double check and confirm what I was brought home in. I'm gonna guess the, from the little that I know. It mine actually might have been a Volkswagen Beetle. From the huh. from the sixties, we said we said brought home, not conceived in. John. Hey, well, that's very po- very possible. It may too. have been one in the same. It may have been may have been the same car. <laughs> one stop shopping. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, listeners, go ahead and tweet, text, whatnot uh, us. What was the very first car you were brought in? That's kind of that is an interesting question. What car do you think you were I like first? That. Yeah, I do, I do. Um, and if it was, especially if it was a Land Rover, we wanted to make a model. That'd be cool. Make, model, engine, color. VIN, with the VIN number. <laughs> we, we want a full V5. <laughs> with the V5, that's right. If you can provide the V5. The first person to provide a V5 for the, fir- for the car that they were brought home in, home in on from the hospital or where, wherever you were born, and uh, it was a Land Rover, I'll send you a sticker. Uh, and fair or, warning, we will or, be able to ter- determine your age. Or if you can provide proof that you were born in a Land Rover. Ooh. Well, born in a Land Rover. That's, that's extra special. Because you're, you're brought home, obviously, but, but you, know, you were actually born in it, which right. makes it even better. Right. Yeah, if you were conceived in a Land Rover, nah, we're going to skip that one. We just yeah, know if you were, sorry. That, that, yeah, that's let's, let's skip that one, yeah. But if you were born... We don't want proof on that one. No, we don't want proof. Not the conception. Yeah, we, don't, we just don't no. want to know. <laughs> no. But if you were born in one, you were actually birthed in a Land Rover, that'd be cool just to know about it. I wonder how many there are out there. So that's the, that, there you go. How's that for the news? <laughs> yeah, how do you follow that? How do you follow that? I think we're done with the news. <laughs> we're done. We're definitely done. <laughs> when we get back from the short break, Morgan's going to give us a field report from the British invasion in Stowe and the Vermont Overland Rally. Yes, it's been a fun, busy month for me. Our man in the meadow, Morgan. Welcome back to the Center Steer Podcast, show number 54 for September 2017. So a special representative from the state of Vermont, Morgan, has gone out to two different shows in the last couple weeks. He went to the uh, British Invasion and the Vermont Overland Rally, and he will tell us about those in just a few minutes. And he also t- uh, did an interview with Peter Vollers of Vermont Overland, and we will have that interview live from the site after he gives us the uh, overview of the two shows. 
Morgan, our special representative correspondent. What, what are we calling you? We need a name. You need something. I do need something, don't I? I think correspondent works, right? I want to thank you, by the way. I know you didn't uh, know I was going to do this. Uh, you set up. You had a booth set up at the Vermont Overland, and you had a nice little slideshow, handed out some stickers. So thanks for thanks for representing the show at the Vermont Overland. No problem. It was uh, a lot of fun. Way more fun than work. So I can't <laughs> complain. <laughs> So tell us and about I the think British. I ran out of stickers, so that's a that's oh, a did? good thing to have happen. Good and uh, yeah, I sent how many? What did I send you? Yeah, I think I had like thirty or something like that. Must have been a lot of people there needing to fix rust holes. <laughs> uh, probably yeah. <laughs> and those are some Especially quality after stickers. One of the days. Yeah, you can fix a pretty good sized hole with our podcast stickers. And it's a nice thick sticker too. It is they exactly. Are. So thanks to Sticker Mule remember. for for those uh, quality stickers. They are uh, they're nice quality stickers. I've used them for other events too. So True. tell us about the British invasion. Yeah. So yeah, the, September is a a good month in Vermont because there are several events going on. Uh, British invasion is generally mid September. So this year it was uh, the fourteenth through the sixteenth. It's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, and it's an all British vehicles car show in Stowe, Vermont, which is uh, a beautiful little uh, tourist town at the base of the Stowe ski area. Um, so gorgeous area to actually have it as well. Uh, it's it, you know, I think like most car shows in New England, specifically British car shows, it's a, a bit of an MG Triumph show. Last yeah. year for Land Rovers, it was pretty rough probably the the lowest number of vehicles i i've seen in the last uh four or five years uh it was about a half a row for all land rover vehicles but this year well how many in a row well uh, it's a pretty big field it's it's probably the size of you know three or four football fields next to each other so it's it's a good size field and that's a row three football three three football fields is a row of cars in uh, a row Sort of like three football fields side by side, three or four side by side. Okay. That's still, what, what's that, it's, about 50, is that 50 yards? Are they 50 yards side to side? Something like that? That's still a lot. Something like that. It's, it's a sizable field. That's still uh, a lot. And you're saying normally it's half of a row. That's still, that's. I think it's still a nice turnout. I mean, it's no Switzerland. Right, right, exactly. So, yeah, usually, it, well, last year was sort of the minimum at half a row, um, which was probably like, 15 vehicles or or something like that so it was pretty low last year but this year it, it rebounded to probably one of the highest numbers i've seen there in the last four or five years and what was especially interesting jim macri of high high meadow farm rovers uh he's out of saxon river vermont he has uh i've just i've met with him a number of times over the years and i had actually set up an interview with him but unfortunately Due to technical difficulties, <laughs> uh, there no the interview didn't work out. So I'm going to actually go back and visit his museum and do a follow up interview. So you'll have to look forward to that. But this year he actually had seven vehicles at the event, and he restores vehicles basically to factory condition. So they're they're in immaculate. You mean better alert. than factory? <laughs> Pretty well, much. Well, and and one of those seven was the unicorn, was it not? It was. So yeah, I mean, he has his. He gets his own little area at this point with his his seven vehicles. Um, so he has worked for the last number of years uh, with his his lead technician, uh, who is Glenn Parent. He's he's worked for a number of years to research and put together a center steer uh, replica, and it's. As far as they all can tell, it's the most se accurate center steer replica out there because there are no no re remaining original center steers. They only made a couple of them anyway. And there's a, a few in, in the UK replicas, but generally they're not particularly accurate. I think he said he looked at one that was in the Dunsfold collection, but it still was running a Land Rover engine, which is not not accurate and some other issues there. Yeah. Uh, from what from what I've seen, all of the other replicas were just series ones that were retrofitted. Pretty much. Yeah. So I, I got to go a couple of years ago and see their rolling chassis. Um, so they they actually had it. Uh, it's a 1942 uh, Ford GPW Jeep chassis 
with GPW axles, which is period right correct. Right. Uh, they're running a 47 Rover P2 engine with, let's see, 42 GPW Jeep combat wheels, also period correct, and a 47 Rover P2 gearbox. So pretty much everything in there is is the same that was used in that original 1947 center steer vehicle. And they so, built all everything else from scratch, as I understand it. They did, yeah. I well, guess they, I guess they'd have to, wouldn't they? They did, yeah. So yeah, there's they had a couple of fabricators. Some guys from Turner Engineering helped with some some pieces. Jim Jero, he did a lot of the measuring and making adapter plates and stuff like that. And then they had Joe Stafford from Bethlehem, New Hampshire, do all the aluminum body work. Because the the hood, the the fenders, the rear body tub, all had to be fabricated, and and uh, I think Jim Jero did a lot of the work on. They had gone to the UK, gotten more of the photos than are are currently available. They had the they had them burned to a CD, flew them back on a plane. So basically, they have a lot of photos that are just not out there on the internet. Full resolution, they were picking photos, finding reference points, meticulously measuring to get every detail as accurate as possible. So they didn't uh, have any drawings or anything? They had to extrapolate everything from photos? Pretty much, yeah. There were very few uh -huh. of the Damn. blueprints left. So yeah, they, it's it's pretty amazing the amount of work wow. and effort they put into it. It's, uh, you know, it's raw aluminum. It's It's amazing to see out out in the sun <laughs> just just gorgeous yeah it takes a special kind of nuts to want to do all that work yeah and the guy who uh who did the body work for them he's over in new hampshire and he does a lot of of basically aluminum classic sports car body restorations he he does it all by hand and he's actually had a number of people now come to him for restorations where they want raw aluminum bodies on their sports cars like mirror finish polish <laughs> right on um, and so he he does those kind of things and they just come out immaculate which is a, a huge amount of effort and and detail to get right to have a raw aluminum polished you know classic sports car and, you know, the great thing about a metal finished body is there's never any argument about how much Bondo is in it. Right. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> what you see is is perfect. It has not. And it's it's hard. Well, work well what that. you see is what you get. That's for sure. Exactly. So, yeah, the the center steer is just amazing to see in person. And of course, they had had them fire up all of his Land Rovers and and run them around the the field to show off so it's it's cool to see it just fire up and drive off <laughs> they give you a ride i didn't get a ride in that one i'm sure when i go down to the museum that that's probably a possibility though i i won't beg for it i want i want to keep that thing staying immaculate as well <laughs> but he actually had another darling of the show as well which is a 1948 series one and it's number 148 I believe in the production. Nice. Um, so that was, I think around, I think at 150 or 151, they changed their production process. So it's one of the last of the, the original production line of the series ones. So that's pretty impressive. And that came to him actually in pretty good condition. It had been previously restored, but just not to his standards. So they restored it again. And he, he had the rest. Oh, he, well, I, I guess another one of his new projects was a 64 Brockhouse trailer that was also freshly restored. And then he had sort of his usual stable, which is a 51 Series 1, and he's got a, a Series 2A and a 3, and a NAS D90, and then a, a newer Range Rover Autobiography Edition. So there's no lack of, of vehicles there by his, from his... his uh, restoration shop and that is a museum that i believe the public can go visit with with just you know some advance notice what's the name so, again of the museum uh it's high meadow farm rovers if you get a chance to go visit jim macri and glenn parent at high meadow farm rovers or stop by british invasion next year 
well worth seeing his vehicles. They are just amazing. I believe that they're pretty much the best you can get without seeing a vehicle that has come out of, of Land Rover's classic restorations process. So pretty impressive. And beyond that, there were actually, like I said, this was one of the biggest years I've seen for Land Rovers, and there were a number of military vehicles. They actually sort of created their own class, even though they weren't supposed to. They parked in a new area, filled up a bunch of vehicles. Derek Chase. Some, some of us, some of us like to think that ex-military Land Rovers are in a class of their own. Right. That was sort of their their thought as well. So I, I witnessed a, one of the officials sort of walking around and asking them how they managed to create their own class when they weren't supposed to. And you know, it just worked because <laughs> we do what we want. That's why. Yeah. And and with the vehicles that they had there, nobody was going to argue with them because a, a Derek Chase of GMR four by four, formerly Green Mountain Rovers before. Right. Land Rover came in and made them change their name before it all happened. <laughs> yeah, he had with him. He had his meat wagon with him. So all right. that's always nice. He also had a 76 Alvis Saracen M Mark six. Nice. Uh, so that was quite impressive. And I can't remember his name, but there was a guy from New Jersey who had an original Pink Panther there as well. An actual Pink Panther. Yeah, it's he said it's one of three he knows about in the U.S. And I didn't know there were any in the one, U.S. Yeah, there's there's apparently three. Oh, well, they're out there. Yeah, there's this one. And then there's one that's somewhere in the Midwest that's in a collection that never gets seen by the public. And then there's one that's in a dealership or a shop somewhere that gets seen but never driven and taken to events. Is, so it was very cool. Is it in the this, camo pink? Where not that the one where it's like gray and pink or is it all? Pink. No, it's all pink. No, they're, all pink. Yeah, they're all pink. I swear I remember seeing ones that were like gray and pink, or am I mistaken? Uh, well, you're either mistaken or that was something special, but the but the the official Pink Panthers are all pink. Yeah, and there were only 72 or something like that that were actually made. And uh, There's one in Gaiden. I know that. I saw that one. Yeah. As there should be. Yeah, definitely. And, and this one came over from, I think it came through maybe from Craddock through the Dunsfold collection or something like that. It turns out that this one is actually far more original and accurate than some of the other ones. So especially than the ones in the U.S. So very cool to see that also again. Is there any history associated around. with it, like where it served or what it what its function was specifically? There is. And he, the owner, has spoken with a number of people who have maybe not driven that specific one, but some of the, the other ones, and they can't give any details on the record. <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> okay, they that's can enough. tell you, but they'll have to kill you. Yeah. He, I think... he said he has gotten some stories, but he will never repeat them. Yeah. So <laughs> That's all you need to know. Yep. So, yeah, it, it, very cool to see see that there were there was also in the military section a, an fc 101 and a, a couple of radio body vehicles and a, a a d90 that was of military origin so that was very nice little show of its own off to the side and obviously very cool to see the saracen up and running uh, and that the best part of that was probably that it had vermont plates on it so it was all registered and and road legal I don't of know course. if they drove it all the way down, but very cool to see that with plates on it. Yeah, actually, I, I'm a big fan of the non-Rover British military vehicles. And if, I, if I had my way and, and, and had the money, uh, I would have a ferret and a stalwart in my nice. driveway. Ferret for just running around town getting groceries. You know, try and door ding this at the parking lot. <laughs> exactly. And when I had big hauling to do, I'd take the stalwart. Yep, that would be awesome. Stalwart is phenomenal. Have you seen some of the YouTube videos where they launch them off cliffs into the lake? No, I haven't seen any of those. I'm going to have to go look some of those up. Because, I mean, they were designed for, for the whole idea of the post-apocalyptic Cold War when there were no roads left and, and, and the bridges got knocked out. Well, no bridge, no problem. You just drive through the water. That was the idea with the stalwart. Well, a bunch of guys who have these things just for toys have figured out, yeah, you can launch them off a pretty good height into the lake and they'll bob back up and you can keep on going. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, yeah. An amphibious heavy truck. That that's that checks 
every last box there is to check. That it does, for sure. <laughs> and the rest of the show, I don't want to say it was it was boring. There were some amazing things. Obviously, other Land Rovers, there were there are quite a few series vehicles. There were uh, a, a number of Defenders there. Quite a few Range Rover Classics, actually, this year. And I think there was maybe only one Discovery. And it was a D1. But... Aside from that, there was probably the only new Land Rover that I saw on the field was a an Evoke, a convertible Evoke. So it looked a little out of place. Well, those One are my f- those are somewhat rare was, too. Was that corporate sponsored? That was not. No, there's really no corporate sponsored vehicles there. That, that wasn't a dealer display or anything, huh? Nope. Yeah, wow. it was just somebody's personal registered obviously <laughs> convertible <laughs> evoke <laughs> one, one would hope <laughs> so you know the, the land rovers there's a lot of a lot of good ones there one of my favorites colby of tin shack restorations has a an original patinaed 1959 series 2 that he got from ike goss of pangolin 4x4 out west and and that one very well patinaed but all original turned out to be the kind of condition that even though he's in Vermont, yeah, it gets garaged in the winter, but he just drives it as is. It's it's gorgeous. So yeah, yeah there's too, a, a number too of nice those to fix there. up. Oh yeah, and it has he he has preserved some of the modifications that the original owner made because as the original owner got older, he couldn't see the speedometer as well because again, you know, that's a NAS vehicle. But with the Series Two, it's a a center instrument panel, so he sort of swapped everything around to move the speedometer closer to the left hand side so he could see it he had some interesting starter modification because it was hard for him to press the the starter and all of that yeah lots of interesting very minor modifications but all are original and and fascinating and, and done to enhance the utility for the owner which is always cool right yeah and and land rovers especially the you know series land rovers they're all pretty unique anyway <laughs> So to see a couple of those just makes them more unique. I like to say they're like snowflakes. No two are alike. It's it's so true. Well, it goes <laughs> to the point that you can take, that's a vehicle you can take and do something to make it unique or make it fit you, all the things you guys have said. And I'm sure there are other vehicles like that, but uh, you know, Land Rover certainly is the one that comes immediately to mind that you can mold it to your needs. And more m- More suited to the important things that you need it to do. Right. Absolutely. I always enjoy an episode when that comes up. <laughs> Anytime we can quote Richard Hammond. Yep. Well, we can do that every time. In fact, we probably do. We do. I like that to happen organically, though. That's nice. Don't, don't want to force we, it. We, we need, that's another little little podcast drinking game we could have going on. A little bell goes off every time Hammond gets quoted. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> and, and it's not just Hammond. It's like that one film that Hammond did, which is like, you know, if he did nothing else in his career, he would still be a legend for that one film. Absolutely. So true. One of my favorites. We got to get him on the show. Uh, yeah, I've tried. I have went to his website and sent, sent an email. Because I figured what else, what other way is there? And uh, I thought there was somebody we knew that we've already talked to that might have a connection. I should try to re-engage that. Yeah, I think we need to try that again. He is on the uh, guest list dream dream list, I suppose. Cool. So yeah, that that's pretty much... Uh, British Invasion, I would highly suggest coming up. It's people come from all over New England. Uh, you know, a lot of the Land Rovers come down from Maine and, and do you get Canadian, up. Canadian Rovers? Do you get any from, I know there's a you know, big contingent in Quebec. I don't know if any of those. Oh guys yeah. Come down. Yeah, definitely. There's a couple with a D90 that I talk to every year who come down from, from Quebec. Yeah. There's quite a few out there. You know, we know about that guy that lives in Montreal that has two two FC 101s. That'd be kind of cool. Yes. Yeah. And actually, I, I'm blanking on his name at the moment, but I had a really nice conversation with the editor of the Series 1 Club's uh, magazine, which is called, I think, Legends. I didn't know And he that. came down from Canada for the first time this year to, to see the show, see Jim Macri's vehicles. It, it was nice to have a conversation with him. Should we get him so, on the yeah, show? We should, absolutely. And I did did offer that up. Good. So, Is yeah, there a we, cost? There's a lot of interesting people there to to meet, lots of cool vehicles. Is there a cost there's, for the show or to, to spectate or to put your vehicle in the show? Is there what, a fee? Yes. Uh, yeah, there's a, a small fee. I think it's around 
$80 per vehicle, something like that, and a little higher if you want, you know, vendor space or anything like that. That's a small fee? Compared to some shows, yeah. Wow. And then entrance fee is $15 for two days or $10 if you show up on the last day because it generally runs Friday, Saturday, Sunday. On Friday, they have a block party in Stowe, so everybody comes down with their vehicles and the center of town is closed off and they have, you know, music and and food vendors and uh, it's the streets are lined with restaurants and stuff as well so that's that's pretty fun and then a- Saturday actually is- on a on a per day that's not a bad bad fee now that now that you say it's multiple days right yeah exactly oh so you and, pay, that, and that includes so you pay 80 dollars to show your vehicle for multiple days then and that gives you access to the to the show also yeah it gives you access to the show for i think two or four people it gives you access to that block party the night before. And I believe that this year they do they did for the first time like a nice dinner event for the people showing their vehicles. So, yeah, it's it's not bad for for that price. We're used to the Vintage Grand Prix, which is like 25 bucks for an afternoon, pretty much. And it's a one day event. So I, it, that makes my, that makes more sense. Right. right. Now, does yeah. that allow you to it'll allow you to get admission for whoever you can stuff in your rover? I think, unfortunately, it's only for like four people. They ah. do let you bring additional, but at a smaller additional. OK, because <laughs> I, I can stuff a fair, fair contingent in my meat wagon, for instance. Yeah. And you, you might still be able to get away with that. If get you show a, up in something cool enough, they'll let you get away with it is what you're saying. Probably. Get a 130 with all the seats in it. Yeah. Or, you know, with the meat wagon, you just toss people on the cots, on the stretchers. Well, it's it's designed so that you can put stretchers on one side or both and have seated casualties on the other if need be. True. And in fact, re- related to the, the meat wagon, Derek Chase, who had his meat wagon there and the Saracen, he and, and one of his buddies were in their full military gear playing cricket for a while there in the and it was a gorgeous sunny day, but it was like 85, 87 degrees or something like that. They were out there in their full gear playing cricket behind uh, okay. the vehicles. So that was pretty funny. It's almost like the EMLRA folks. They when they go out to uh, the show, they go in full military garb, of course, and they they, yeah. they put on the show. Yep. Yeah. Similar to that, for sure. So, yeah, it's it's a, an event worth seeing. And like I said, plenty of MGs and, and triumphs and stuff like that. Well, you'll get that. Oh, of course. Uh, and quite a few Mordens. They had a number of, of newer vehicles. There were a surprising number of Lotus Elises, things like that. Probably the only one that I was not sure how they snuck it in was the DeLorean. It, it was, was produced. Manuf- it, it was produced in the Republic of Northern Ireland. That's a British vehicle. Yeah, but it was target for American audience. Same same reason you can get Nash Metropolitans in a British car show. Uh, true. Same way. It's it's <laughs> it's manufactured in the UK. Yep. With lots and lots of financial support from Her Majesty. So <laughs> there you go. True. So yeah, yeah, great show. I would highly suggest people come up. Stowe is a beautiful area anyway, and it's at the bottom of the the Stowe Access Road, which if you follow that up to the top, you get to Smuggler's Notch, which is a nice little drive bet- through a glacial boulder field, which is something not to be missed because there's not many places where you get to drive through a glacier boulder field. Well, through beats over. It does. Yeah. What about lodging? Is there places to stay, hotels? Camping? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's there's so much so many lodging options around, so many food options and honestly, you know, Vermont's not a big state. It's only a couple hours to go, you know, end to end. So, once you're in Stowe, it's pretty easy to get up to Burlington or or go down to southern Vermont, skirt over to New Hampshire or who yeah. would go to Burlington? I was going to say couple hours end to end that's the long way that is the other way other way is far less than that well the funny thing is the other way there are no main highways so you're taking all back roads and it still takes about the same amount of time really okay (laughs) yeah (laughs) we only have (laughs) north south travel routes east west are all small roads don't ask me why I guess that's kind of like it here, is here in PA. There are more roads going east-west than there are going north-south. I think for a state like ours, they only really cared about people getting from Montreal to Boston or New York. In other words, they matters. felt it was a 
good place to go through but not stick around huh? <laughs> yes so yeah that was that was my middle of the month event and then the event that i just got back from yesterday and was the, and the Vermont. reason by the way we've had to delay the podcast because we wanted to have fresh off the presses yes yes and i appreciate the delaying of the podcast so i came down from i live in the burlington area i went down to central vermont to the vermont overland rally which is an annual off-road event and it's a four-day event it's basically thursday friday saturday sunday with thursday and sunday being sort of pack it pack up and set up days it's an event where you basically come to central vermont to peter Voller's home or at least the last couple of years it's been based out of at, at his home in Reading, Vermont. You show up, camp on his land. He's got a whole bunch of camping areas. He's got the nice vendor area with some food options and then a big tent for a main tent. That's where I had our booth set up was up in the vendor area. Then you've got some camping areas, one pretty big quiet area, then the main sort of louder camping area, and then actually some over the stream and through the woods camping where you get to pick your pick and make your own site. So there's something for everybody there. And then once you're there, it's pretty free form. He's got a couple of rules, basically drive slow, no drinking until the vehicles are back and parked. And otherwise he hands over these V trans maps, which are, uh, that's the Vermont transportation De or department of transfer transportation. So they have town maps for the entirety of the state, which shows all roads and includes legal trails and class four roads, which are unmaintained public access ways. So he hands over these maps and they have gone out, explored these trails and rated a number of them from green, yellow, blue, red. And then this year they added a sort of purplish pink color, which is beyond red. Um, and those are difficulty ratings. So then the rest of the time, you just get to meet up with whoever you want, go out and hit the trails. The maps, they cover quite a bit of the state. And since it's not that long to go to either end of the state, you can go pretty far, hit trails for a number of hours and then come back, camp, eat and repeat. <laughs> So it's a very cool event. He says it's basically the event where you get to go and, and use your driving skills, whereas most other events are sort of, you know, vendor and educational events. Now, they they did have, and every year for the last number of years, they've had OEX, the Overland Experts. They come and do a, a free seminar and some on-trails training. And they happen to be actually the booth next to mine. So I, I hung out with them quite a bit. Uh, had a number of conversations with Ted and Don, who were the trainers that were there. They brought along a Toyota Hilux, a diesel one, that they had imported under the usual uh, three-year rule because they use it for military training. So then they have to ship them back overseas once they're done. We're still jealous. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, I'm uh, just picturing all the ways we could attempt to kill it. To kill the Hilux? Yeah. Yes. Drop it off. Since the... it supposedly can't be done. It was a pretty rugged vehicle. I will definitely say that. And very capable being off-road. And unlike the Tacoma that we have here in the U.S., it is definitely built much more robustly. Like right. the Tacoma here in the U.S., which is, you know, roughly equivalent, is not quite equivalent. I believe that the Tacomas still only have drum brakes in the rear, whereas the Hilux, they've, they all have disc brake all, all around and a whole bunch of differences. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a much more capable vehicle. And the OEX guys, they were extremely knowledgeable. And one of the things that they do in their training, you know, they have the, the sort of usual training to make sure that you're, you understand your vehicle and that you're being safe and that you're using the, the skills that you should use to travel safely on the back roads and how to recover if you get stuck. But one of the things that they really stress, which comes from Bruce Elfstrom, their CEO, his training method is to, to basically try to leave as little impact as possible and to use your vehicle to its fullest without using the extra accessories and features that it might have. 
so that you really know what you could do with a stock vehicle or, you know, stock functionality anyway, whether you whether you have it lifted or or anything like that. And so he he stresses, you know, low wheel spin and getting up without lockers and stuff like that. So it's very interesting training to to go through and see how they they stress that and how you can do that. And I was actually there in my my <coughs> pardon me Pathfinder, <laughs> um, which was stock, but had I tossed some Ko twos on it before I went because I I needed some good tires for winter anyway. So I was there in a stock Pathfinder with it has tree bars and a rear limited slip diff. Uh, but beyond that was stock height and all of that. And I went out on their training and we were able to go up some red trails and I basically had no issues. I never got stuck, didn't damage my vehicle. <laughs> it was it was great to to be able to go through that and went with a number of Toyota and Jeep guys. There was one D2 that was ahead of me. So it was, it was just nice to go out and, and get that training with them. And they do actually offer those trainings on site. They have facilities in Connecticut, Virginia, North Carolina. As I said, they do some military training, but they also do recreational 4x4 training and then some professional trainings. And they also have trips that they they do. They have off-road trips. They often have one to Iceland. They had one earlier this year. And they have uh, defenders that have the massive snow tires for driving around in Iceland. I believe they have a Mongolia trip still coming up this year. Very cool. They're the Bill Burke of the East. They are, yeah. And they definitely, they are friends with Bill Burke. They they communicate with him fairly regularly. So, you know, they have some pretty good interaction with him. And they're very very pragmatic as well. They understand a lot of the, obviously the techniques and the physics of it and all those safety and recovery methods. They're very good at sort of going through all the different options and saying, well, some people believe this, some people believe that. This is our experience. You can try this. They're very, very considerate of all the options and they're very, very vehicle independent. They have a wide range of vehicles that they use on their their training centers and you can use your own vehicle in your in their training centers i after spending a couple of days with them and going out on the trails with them i would highly highly suggest their services and they do individual and group trainings and stuff like that so i would check them out and obviously if you come to vermont overland you can get your free training from them (laughs) but very cool to have them there and that's Years ago at Vermont Overland, they do used to do more events. This is pretty much the only training seminar kind of thing that they have left. I've got the interview with Peter Vollers, so I'll I'll let him go into a lot more detail of that aspect of Vermont Overland and and some of the the reasons behind Vermont Overland. But it was just a blast to go out there, meet tons of people from. All over the Northeast, there were some people as far as Virginia and Florida who came up, all sorts of vehicles. Peter Vollers has, we didn't really get into this in the interview, but he's got a four-door Range Rover Classic. A number of years ago, he had a modified a Series 1. His his sort of co-organizer, Steve, has a, a zebra-striped D2 that's built for off-road. That was pretty nice. I saw and met a number of people with D90s and series vehicles. There was also a nice D110 that had just been restored and and modified with Mercedes diesel mounted or uh, connected to a an LT230 for the transfer case and all sorts of of stuff that was great and you know lots of D1s and D2s and quite a few Range Rover classics Mainline Overland was there with a a pretty built Range Rover Sport, which is not quite my thing, but it it was pretty pretty capable off road. There were a lot of other interesting vehicles there too. Several Unimogs. There were two Pinsgauers, uh, right one on. six by six and a four by four. There was also a quite capable Subaru Justy that was out on the trails. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So yeah, it's. It's a, an event for pretty much anyone and everyone who wants to go off-road. And these are all legal roads in Vermont. So it's it's a great way to tour Vermont. Highly, highly suggest it. 
So how many total vehicles would you estimate were there? Do you, and I guess, do you camp there? Is it camp on site or? Yeah, there's, there's camping on site and there's a fee for vehicles. I can't remember what it was this year. And basically you just pay per vehicle. So you can pack as many people into the vehicle as you want and you pay per vehicle. Once you get there, they put a sticker on your vehicle so that they know which vehicles have paid and which have not. There and then, go. yeah, and it, again, it's like a four day event and there are our vendor vendor spots as well. And so there's on site camping. They have food vendors there. There was there were a couple of great pizza trucks there and they have uh, Jimmy's Cook Shack, which is there, which is sort of their their main food vendor. And there are also a number of places to stay fairly nearby as well. So if you don't want to camp, you don't have to. You can just show up and, and attend the event and sleep elsewhere. But there were a lot of people there with, you know, campers and rooftop tents and full on overlanding vehicles that they were camping in. So there's all sorts of options there for sleeping as well. And I, th- I think this year there were probably about 150 vehicles. I'm not entirely sure, but it's a pretty good size crowd. The tickets usually go on sale on New Year's Day of each year, and they sell out pretty quickly. I think I had to buy my vendor seat within about a week of tickets going on sale last year. And I think at that point, most of the regular attendee slots had already sold out. Inter- interesting that he would limit the size of the event. Well, I think part of that is because he only has so much space to house people on his land, even though he's got it fairly spread out. But then the other aspect of it is just how sustainable it is, because if everybody is heading out onto these these trails from a central location, you start to get either traffic jams if people want to take the same trails or you might get you know, local residents or businesses who are annoyed by having a ton of all these off-road vehicles just swarming through the area. Is there a common dinner like many like many of the events have, or is it more uh, around the fire eating? Not really. It's, it's very, like I said, very free form. So, mm-hmm. you know, they do have food vendors, and most people are also, you know, cooking as well at their own campsites. No t-shirt? People, what's that? No t-shirt? They do tell, sell like hats and, and stuff like that. They uh, they do have a raffle on the Saturday night. They have had quite a bit of gear this year. They had a nice super winch winch that, that they were raffling. They had a more power puller. They had a number of, of things in that that genre for off-road recovery gear and t-shirts and other merch as well that they were raffling off. And you had a booth and how did, uh, how did that go? What, any, yeah. It wasn't really a booth, was it? I mean, it was probably just a tent and a table, right? Yeah, pretty much. But that's, that's generally what most of the booths are at the event. So yeah, I had a, a table set up with a, a slideshow show going and handing out stickers and cards, played a few episodes and talked to a lot of people. So yeah, it was a lot of fun. Did our best of, right? I did. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Definitely had our slideshow included the best of a number of our guests because we've had so many awesome events over the years. So I I dug through our archives to fit it and pick those out. You shared that with me and I went through it and I'm like, did we really have this person and this person and this (laughs) person? I was like, we did. I was actually impressed myself. Right. And some of them are multiple times. Like, how many times have we had the bells on the show? Oh, yeah, the bells and Jeff. and Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm still trying to process how you put together a slideshow of a radio show. Yeah, it was interesting. You're, you're taking, what, still shots from our guests' collection or portraits of the guests or something? Is that what you're doing? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Yeah. And just showing off who the guests were and, and why they're interesting people. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. And then I had I had probably three quarters of our episodes downloaded and playing in the in the background. And I have to admit, I also took all of the Camel Trophy videos that I have collected with me. Oh, well, there you go. That's cool. Yeah. Just to have, you know, something else playing. Yeah. And it's uh Visuals you know, are good. On that on that note, this is in the middle of Vermont, in the woods. Well, woods and fields, but there is no cell service out there. It's also kind of nice to just be unplugged 
when you're out there in addition to being at the event because you get to go hang out with all the people see all their vehicles go driving on them on all sorts of terrain and just get to know them but then you also just that's all anybody really can do while they're there is hang out drive eat drink that's it <laughs> sounds, so it's, sounds like it's every land rover nice. event i've been to right it's it's very cool well worth it and and once you attend the the event you get to keep the maps and you get to come back and travel them whenever you want yeah so is, so is that helping you find new ways to get to your clients probably having yeah. a map with all the really cool roads written in yeah definitely and it, and it's funny all of these maps are freely available so i've used them before and gone and explored them before but you really have no idea what you're getting into or what you're going to find, except with the ones that Peter Vollers and his team have put together because they've pre-run all of them several times throughout the year and then then rated each of the trails. Now they don't rate everything, but they try to give a nice set of of trails throughout a number of different towns and counties to That's let you nice. explore. Yeah, it's really nice. Man, if you want to just, you, you, you're thinking you got an afternoon and you just want to go out and do a, a sporty trail just to see what, what happens to your truck, you can pick one off this map pretty easily. Yeah, very easily. And in, in fact, I had a few that I saved up because, you know, I was in the middle of the state. There was no reason for me to drive halfway home, go find a trail and, and drive back to the event. So I saved a couple for my trip home and just did them on the way. There you go. I'm holding in my hand the compass that I got when I was down at SCAR from doing the, and Bill Burke showing us how to use a compass for reckoning. And you could combine those two, see, but use your comp an actual compass and use the maps and do it old school. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. No batteries required. Yeah. And, and these, you know, all the trails, they're great for, for cycling, for off-roading. There's lots of people who do, you know, motorcycle trips through them, hiking, so so I guess the way you're, these are mainly green lo green laning type trails, or I, I assume there's not boulder strewn you know, with the. Oh of no, trees there around. there are definitely boulder strewn trails. Oh, okay. So for example, the you know yes the probably what's listed as green or blue is more like green la green laning, but it is through Vermont mountainous regions, so it. It's still a little more intense than what many might consider to be green laning. Will you get Pennsylvania pinstriping? Oh, yeah. We, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can't call yeah, it Vermont pinstriping. It's not alliterative. Yeah, it's it's true. Uh, Pennsylvania pinstriping, it, it's much more alliterative than what we have here. But, you know, we have Vermont air conditioning. That works reasonably <laughs> well. <laughs> What's that, rust holes? No, that's that's for your pedal power. Okay. <laughs> Back in the Midwest, we called that floor air. Oh, nice. That makes sense. But yeah, no, there's one of the trails which got sort of changed to the new pinkish purple color, which was supposed to be beyond red, was basically a stream bed with, you know, it's been relatively dry recently, so there wasn't a whole lot of water flowing through it. But there were definitely square boulders that were probably picnic table sized strewn all about it, many of which you had to straddle to to get through the section. So so it's, in other words, there will be damage. Oh, there's absolutely damage. This is definitely the kind of event where lots of people break things. <laughs> <laughs> that Subaru Justy, I think it burned out its clutch. There were lots of of popped beads, broken uh -huh. drive shafts, snapped axles. Yeah, there there was a lot of everything. And there are plenty of trails that doesn't happen on too, I assume. Yeah, and that's that's part of the rating. The the benefit of the rating, too, is that it's nice to know, oh, these are the ones that you can just go do and it's going to be pretty easy. But then, yeah, there are some of those ones that get used in the Vermont uh, Trophy event, the VOT Vermont Overland Trophy, which is modeled roughly after the early Camel Trophy series. Right. And and those are really intense courses. And the funny thing is that since most of these are class four roads, so they're actually, you know, legal roads, they're on old maps. A lot of GPSs will try to send people out these roads. <laughs> so 
there i talked to a couple of people who lived in vermont who on their way down they were like oh no i'm just taking this route but their gps kept trying to send them various routes in then later they heard people talking about the crazy trails they had been on and sure enough they were the same roads the gps was trying to send them down and there's there's trails like suicide gulch and all this crazy stuff so it's it's pretty intense are there organized runs or these are all just as you as you wish? They're pretty much just as you wish. The OEX training run is pretty much the only one that's organized. And that's actually mostly on private Vermont Overland Rally property, just to make sure that they're that during trainings they're not on the, the main trails and, and possibly holding people up. What about night runs? Oh, there are definitely night runs. Yeah, lots of that. Because again, it's it's just whatever you want to do. The weather was actually pretty nice. It was, well, until Wednesday, it was 90 degrees in Vermont for half the week. And then it, it dropped down to pretty reasonable, you know, 70s temperatures dropping down into the, the 40s at night. And so Thursday, Friday were beautiful. Sunday was beautiful. Saturday was pretty cold and rainy in central Vermont, though not in all of Vermont. And then we got our first frost on on Saturday night, Sunday morning. So, you know, it's it's real, real (laughs) Vermont camping weather, too. You know, you can't have a rover rally without rain. It's true. So, yeah, probably one of the best events that I've I've uh, attended in in quite a long time and definitely something I'll be going back to again. I had been to a previous event and didn't make it out on the trails at that one. So. I'm definitely signing up again next year. And I want to take a a moment to to thank Peter Vollers for obviously not only putting on the event, but taking the time to sit down with me. Because it's such a a crazy event, obviously for him as organizer and for all of the attendees doing just whatever we wanted while we were there, I didn't actually get to catch him until Sunday morning when everybody was packing up. And that's that's the day after this sort of Saturday is the big day. That's when they do the uh, raffle at night. And obviously in the evenings, there's a fair amount of drinking. But we had a great interview. Take a listen to that. So, yeah, I'm sitting here with Peter Vollers of Vermont Overland. And we just finished up the 2017 Vermont Overland Rally. I think we all had a lot of fun and are a little exhausted. <laughs> Totally. <laughs> so did I hear you say that this was the seventh year? This is the seventh year of the rally. And it kind of feels like it, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's uh it's it's been like a long standing tradition almost, but it's um oh and I'm, as you can probably tell I'm pretty strung out because was we finished up the long weekend, but it's um And last night was the big night too, oh. so and it really starts like on Wednesday night because we're setting, we're doing a mad dash for the setup because things can't be set up that early. And then <clears throat> we go into Thursday and it's like, boom, people are here in the morning just coming in hot and heavy. Thank God for Sophie, Sophie Ostrovitz, who's sitting here in the room. She, uh, she's my registration manager. And, and that's really what a lot of this is a group effort. You know, we do the best we can and in the, I'm the planner, obviously, and I handle all the pre-planning, but it's really, you know, these, my staff members and stuff, they come together and they help so much like Steve and Sophie and then Ron helping with the parking and stuff like that. And I just could never do it alone, but it's, um, it's what, what really drives us all is, and every year it's, you know, it's one that I do bicycle races as well. And it's, it's much more of a socially acceptable activity, the bicycle racing. So, right. And, and of course in our world, you know, the the off-road aspect is we look at it as adventure and we look at it as um, this, uh, this amazing experiential thing. But outsiders don't always see it that way. But because of that, that rub with the outsiders, it makes it a challenging event to put on. And every year I'm sort of like, do I want to do this again? Do I really want to do this again? But what always brings us back is the fact that you guys love it. We do. And that's really what it is. They love it. Like people, and I, I, all I can remember, I don't remember any of the work. I don't remember any of the stress, any of the anxiety. All I can remember each year is the smiling faces and, and the people saying, thank you so much for such a great experience. And it's like, and then I can't wait to do it again. Yeah. You know? 
It's like I don't remember any any negative aspect at all. And there really is very little. We always get a little bit of issues here and there with some logistics or somebody didn't get the camp spot that they wanted or something like that. But most of the time, people are ecstatic when yeah. they leave. So and this really is, does it. This is such a unique event, too, because not only are we coming out to Vermont and, like, going out on actually pl- public roads, except you have, you have yeah. a couple of private trails yeah. around the area, yeah. but it's there's, like, two rules. Yeah. It's just here to come out and go have That's fun really what and it is. explore And Vermont. that is by design. And every year, you know, when we do, like, the debrief, we start talking about rules because we, we had some issue happen. But I say, guys, 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 you know, we're not going to... I hate dumbing things down to the lowest common denominator. And that's what happens when you start creating rules for the one-off instance that something goes wrong. Like, we, had, we did have an issue last night with a guy... Um, with a generator behind like a major RV in the, in the crowded camping area. But it was like, that was the first time that's happened in seven years. Right. You know, and I told the people who had the issue with it, I said, listen, you know, this is what it is. I mean, you're, you're, you're in a very crowded camping area. We have other areas that are way less crowded. We have a whole quiet area. So you can always do that. And the issue's resolved. But we talked about making these rules and I said, no. I said, the whole idea of VOR is, is for people to escape that. Right. You know, when you come here, it's all about just having fun. And that's really what we've done. When it first started out, it was it was with Overland Journal. And, right. it, and Overland International was really their event. And they part of brought me on to run it. And then through the years, they sort of were like they pared it down. So really all they wanted to do um, is really do the, the Western Overland event. That's run by rover enthusiast Ray Highland. He's right. just awesome. So he also helps with the Mid-Atlantic Overland Rally. But it was a lot of activities and a lot of things. It was very much modeled after what you might see at, at any of the Expo East or West events. You know, there was all these activities and seminars and things like that. And we have literally just pared all that away. Because we're like, right. we're, the people really value what you get with VOR is you get adventure here. You go to those events to get your skills and get your training and do stuff like that. And you come here to use that stuff. You use it. So you come and you're going to camp rough. You're going to use your all your equipment, your camping equipment. Your your you know you're going to use your cold weather camping equipment, which is important because people they don't realize how cold it gets. It was right. 34 degrees last night. Yeah, 33 degrees. We had frost. Right. You know, so you got to use that stuff. And if you're not comfortable, you're going to know it. You're not going to sleep, and you're not going to do that stuff. But it 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 gives people a chance to really. I mean, how many times you go to some event, you barely use any of your stuff, and you're not really using your resources. Plus, you get to get out on the trail. And that's the thing is we've got these class four roads here in Vermont. And that is something that people have really taken to. I, I still think there are people out there who need help with the mapping and the navigational aspect. But I think most people really do get it. And they, they really embrace it. Because what I hear about afterwards, or I see them, I see people coming in, you know, in, in towards the end of the fall, even after VOR, certainly during the summer, and they're using the maps and right. they're getting out and they're doing their own adventure. And that's really the whole thing. VOR trains you to come back to Vermont and be able to recreate your own experience and get, you know, go to your own navigation and, and, and go get a maple creamy and know where the good restaurants are and, and explore. And people have a blast doing it. And really what that does, there's always, there's a bigger, much bigger picture motive for me with all this stuff in that Vermont is a place of small business and small business is how our state kind of thrives. We don't really have a lot of large corporations here, but the small businesses are like the stores, the pottery places, the the art galleries, the small cafes, and things like that. And that this is the demographic that intensely supports those small businesses. I'm Vermont Overland right. is itself a small business. People ask me all the time, "Who's your charity? Who's your charity?" I'm like, uh, "My kids' college education is my charity." I'm like, "I do this to make extra money." For my family, and there's nothing wrong with it. I wear, I, I, I say that with my head held high. I'm a small business. It's right. supposed to be profitable because people say, well, you know, he's making all this money, and believe me, it's not all this money. I make far more money sitting at my desk as a lawyer every day than I would with Vermont Overland. But I, I like to prove the fact that I have, you know, lawyers, they always say about lawyers, we always admire entrepreneurs because lawyers sell a product that people don't want to buy. And there's really nothing better than having a product that people actually want to buy. Exactly. And and that really is that really is the Vermont Overland thing is is I've got a pro I got a product that people are crawling over each other to buy, especially with VOR, it sells out rapidly. It does. So 
that's really a, a very grat. I have to I have to say that's really a gratifying thing. It's almost addictive because it's like wow, I created this with my own two hands, and people like it. You know, there's just very few other things in life that are more satisfying with that. Yeah. You know, some people paint pictures, other people make pottery, other people take photographs. I create experiences for people, and I just love doing it. Yeah, and and you do so much work to even, you know, prepare for it. What people don't seem to understand is like those maps with the class four roads. Yeah, they're freely available, but you've gone through all the hard work to go run those roads throughout the year, classify them. The classifying them is immensely helpful because otherwise you go out there, you don't know what might actually be blocked off. You don't know, can you get through that? Right. Uh, you you grade them green, blue, red. And this this year you have the sort of even the purple, pink, pink pink purple. purple. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and some of those are pretty intense. It is. So, In fact, we have a great story about that. So you may not have heard of this. But one of the great stories of the weekend, we had a, a fam, a guy, a uh, husband and wife who were up. They went to the alchemist in Stowe to get some heady topper. Yep. And then they said, well, let's try to make it over. Let's do our own route to make it over to Hill Farmstead. So heady toppers in Stowe, which is the northwesterly part of the state, Hill Farmstead is in Greensboro, which is in the Northeast Kingdom. So they 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 did what what I always tell people they can do. They downloaded the maps that were not on our map set. They were near the Stowe area. One of those was the town of Elmore, which actually has an amazing network of trails. Uh, but they chose some trails that there are some that appear on the map but are not really there on the ground. And they did they did this route, and they were all by themselves. They were in a stock Tacoma with all-terrain tires and they did have a winch but they ended up taking one of these roads and it descended down like a muddy hill and then without them really realizing it there was a, a wet section at the bottom and they decided to just go for it and they got absolutely bogged oh. so they were stuck luckily they had cell phone coverage so which is extremely which is extremely rare, rare especially in Elmore yeah. I mean, Elmore is the middle of nowhere Northeast so, Kingdom is yeah there's nothing. oh yeah so they were just like what do we do I tried calling me, and I was, of course, running around like a chicken with my head cut off. And I almost never can take phone calls. I, I can, I can take texts, but I, and I didn't get, I didn't get any emergency texts, so I didn't pick up on it. So what they did is they had the wherewithal to call Hill Farmstead because they knew that was on our, on our, on our maps, as a destination. And they left word. They just said, "Is anybody there wearing a Vermont Overland hat? If you see anybody wearing a hat." And they're like, no, nobody's here right now. But they said, if you see anybody wearing one, can you have them call this number? I'm in distress. I need help. And they had tried to call um, 911. Yeah. And police got on the phone. They said, listen, there's nothing we can do for you there. They, right. they knew the area vaguely. And they were like, you're just going to have to find your way out. And even a tow truck was not going to get in there. Oh, Nobody no. was going to come in. So they would have had to, if they, the only last resort, they would have had to go hire a farmer with a tractor to drag them out of there, which actually is not, is, is done fairly often because there's a lot of farms. Yeah. So that wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been such a major emergency, but the day's ticking away. It's getting dark. They're starting to panic. And then what do they get? They get a phone call. They get a phone call from Mike Cito, Land Rover owner from New Jersey. And he's like, what's up guys? How can I help? And that's actually... I'll touch on that. That's actually a very Land Rover esque thing, because Land Rover people, they we all know that the trucks are not that reliable. And <laughs> when somebody calls in distress, you jump on it, you act. So, so Mike was happened to be at Hill Farmstead with a group of guys who are very experienced, as is he. And uh, and they said, "Listen, just get me, just calm down." The wife was like crying and everything, and, and he was like, "Just calm down and get me the coordinates of where you are. Just give me GPS coordinates," because they were trying to explain, but. Um, and they were, they were in the process of downloading the map. They said they also had GPSs, so they were like, get me the GPS coordinates. So they had a good, a good take on where they were in Elmore. And then they were able to get the map, and they were like, oh, you're on town highway such and such. And they buzzed right over and came to them, and it took them a while to get there. I think a good hour, like oh, driving bet. on the roads. But they had they, – and it was, it was a difficult extraction. I mean, they had to like – because once you slide another truck down there, that truck stuck. So yeah. they had to like daisy chain some trucks together from the top, be able to get within winching range, and then get on the, the stuck vehicle, winch that out of the mud, and then winch the recovery trucks back up the hill. <laughs> and then really what they needed to do, ideally, was turn this Tacoma around so he could dr and then drive back up the hill. And they used their max tracks. But again, they're using all their equipment. And this is the VOR way. Right. You're using all your equipment. You're getting out there, and you're testing 
and you know, and, and you're using, you're keeping your wits about you. You've also been camping for a couple of days. So you haven't slept that much. It's actually relates to another event we do called VOT, which is our extreme four day event. It's, you know, you're, you're, you're using everything you got, but they got these people out and everybody didn't get back until like literally 10 in the morning. And it was like, I mean, 10, I'm sorry, 10 at night. And these guys, I happened to be right up by the pool when the Tacoma covered in mud came in and he just says, I got a story for you. And he told me the whole story and I knew it was Mike because he said, Mike, the guy with the the, uh, green discovery. And I was like, oh my God. And that really warned me because it was everything we stand for. It was getting out and challenging yourself. It was learning about, you know, it's not just every road is open. You know, you've got... You've got roads that appear on the map, but that are not really drivable. And I always try to tell people, well, one rule of thumb is if no one's driven it before you and it's not obviously been driven and gone through, that generally better to wait and do that later at a later time, at least when you've got more people with you, and, and really just wait till some local guy gets through it first, <clears throat> and then you can go. Um, but it, it, it had you know the camaraderie aspect, it had using all your equipment aspect, because, you know, a lot of overlanders think, oh, I have this equipment just in case I need it. That's not right. No. You need, you need to know how to use that equipment. That's why the one thing we've always had as a seminar, which we've never gotten rid of, is having OEX here, Overland Experts from Connecticut. And because we've gotten rid of every other seminar, we have nothing else but them because it's so important that people who are brand new at this, and we have a lot of dead newbies here, know how to use their equipment. And there, is, there are rules to that. It's not just common sense. There are a lot of things like shackles and stuff that people don't really know how to use. They like little, I, w- I actually uh, listened in on one of the ones that we did in Barnard this past weekend with OEX and simple things like keep your winch tree strap near you in the truck. How many times have we seen somebody totally stuck and have to get out of their vehicle, go to the back of the vehicle, unwrap their winch stuff, get it out of some bag and then do it. And many times you might not have that luxury. Right. You might be up against a tree. You might not be able to get it. So you might well, be holding a truck with no parking brake, no way to chop. You may the you may have to stay yeah. in it. You know, you may because you're hanging, you know, by by your you know, basically just hanging by your brakes. So and it had all that aspect. But and I love the fact that people came to each other's aid because it is a weird event how we don't have lead runs. You know, we've got people just sort of going out and doing their own thing, which which people are astonished with. They're like, You just let people just go? I'm like, listen, it's public road. Right. Everything is public road. They're allowed to go wherever they want. We have people who just go shopping in Woodstock if they want. So, but it's what happens is great in that you're never that far. And it gives you some security in Vermont because one, you're never that far that you can't walk out. If you have reasonable right. fitness, you can walk out of a trail anywhere in Vermont. Number two is, is that you're never that far from help. Like if you really need help, you can walk out and get a farmer with a tractor, pay him to come tow you out. But you're also, they were close enough to even have other people in the event. And this is miles away from the event. And I love, that's the last thing I loved about it is that people are going far and wide. They're getting out. State's not that big. In two hours either direction, you can be in any corner of the state. So it's pretty awesome that people are going f- further than even what I am suggesting on right. the maps. And it's just it, that just warms my heart, too. Because really, and this is, this is another major tenet of what we do at Vermont Overland, a lot of people, especially local guys, like local native Vermonters, get really angry with me because they're like, you're bringing all these people in and showing them our trails. And I'm like, for one, they're not our trails. They're public roads. But I'm like, the bottom line of that is, it's, it seems a little counterintuitive. Trails get shut down and roads get discontinued by towns. They're all under the control of the towns, not because of overuse, almost never. It does happen very, very rarely. And it's usually when kids get in there and party. Right. That's about the only time. But it's never because of people going in and driving the road. Driving the road is what keeps them open. Because the first thing, when a landowner, it's usually a landowner who's there, lives at the end of the maintained road, and then when it becomes an unmaintained, they want to get that thrown up because they don't want any, thrown up means discontinued. They don't want to have people coming through. So the landowners will petition the town to get these roads discontinued. The first thing the towns do is they go and inspect the road, and if they see any use of it, they say, I'm sorry, we're not going to do this. People are using this. So I always, my, my motto with town roads is use them or lose them. Right. Because if you if you if we stop using them, they get covered in deadfall and, and landowners have a much greater chance of having them discontinued. And I always I'm a real estate lawyer by trade. And, and touching on the landowner issue, I always tell the landowners, I say and my clients buying up here and I have a lot of second home clients, I say embrace your class four roads. 
because it provides a valuable recreational access point for your property. You get to go and use that road crossing somebody else's property nearby. You can go bike on it, you can walk on it, you can hike on it. And the fact that people are driving it is a bit of a symbiotic relationship because they're clearing the deadfall out for you and they're keeping it open, you know? So embrace it, don't, don't fight it. It's part of Vermont's culture. It's part of our incredible rich history of ag- ag- agrarian um, yeah. society where people just created roads because they had to travel that road every day and they were on horse and buggy and yeah. that was the easiest way to get there. And we also have this quirk, unlike most states, where our ancient roads do not discontinue, do not lapse with time. They stay there forever until they're actually discontinued by a fairly formal process with the town. Right. So that's a big part of it. And and all this just spells, I mean, you're out there, you know, people get out and they have this adventure, but there's so much history involved. I mean, there's there's ancient cemeteries out there. There's Revolutionary War cemeteries. I, I mark these things on all the maps. There's tons um, of root cellars. Tons of root cellars there. and like all these different things that you can see. Um, it's really unlike any other state. It's, it's certainly unlike out west. I mean, out west has its own merits, but this is so much more intimate. You know, you come out at a major estate, like a you know, five million dollar home, and you're driving right through the property on a class four road, and you right. get to see that up close and personal. Pretty awesome. Yeah, it's very awesome. And I will say that you know, we had uh, Hurricane Irene hit us pretty hard oh, yeah. a number of years ago, and there were certain sections where all the main roads were washed out. And, you know, it wasn't super common, but there were some areas where people knew oh, yeah. old class four roads yes. and they were used to get two people to bring supplies yeah. to people, keeping those open. It's great for rec- recreation, oh, yeah. but we never know totally. when you might use them. And that's the thing. <laughs> that's my, that's really one of my main goals now going forward is I've got, I represent the town of Barnard um, in, in their class four road matters. And I, I said, listen, first thing we're going to do is I want every single class four road marked with a class four road sign. Because it's not just for recreational use, it's also for navigation safety. Right. Get a lot of guys in Priuses who their nav system brings them through a road like that. Yeah. But it, it also is um, it's just something where people should know that it's not maintained. Right. You know? And so we're trying to work with uh, VTrans, and actually the governor's office, the chief of staff is interested in this as a, as a, a way of increasing commerce, which we're desperate to do in Vermont. We're losing so many young people out of state who can't afford to live here because the real estate prices have gone gotten so high and and it hasn't kept up with salaries and wages. So, you know, one of the ways to do that is is bring more recreation in. Recreation always brings dollars. People people always want to spend on that. But I was like, guys, we got to mark these roads because a lot of them it's very confusing. Of course, our the the Avenza system that we use for Vermont Overland is fairly foolproof once you know how to use it. But most people are not going to do that. Right? They're going to look on the Delorme <laughs> Atlas and they're going to be like, "Oh, let's go take this road." But it really helps to have a sign. And, you know, it a does. sign a sign tells the story. So, the idea is what I'm trying to do is get it mandated by as a rulemaking thing because there's a thing called the Uniform Traffic Control Manual, which is a which is a national. Um, book about rules of just general traffic markings to create consistency around the country. Almost every state has adopted it. Vermont has adopted it. And it does say that roads that are not maintained need to are required to have signage. And I actually researched this a couple years ago and I brought it to VTRANS, Vermont Department of Transportation's attention and said, guys, this is mandatory. It's got to be done. Yeah. And then the person at VTRANS said, well, no, there's except there's an, there's a, very narrow exception later on in the, in the manual that says that roads that are unimportant do not need to be marked. And I just said to her, I, I just did one thing. I just replied. I said, ask anybody during who, who went through Hurricane Irene right. whether these roads are unimportant. I go, there were so many of these roads that people relied upon. And she said, that's a good point. And I was like, there. So if we just get Jack. Sorry, my dog. <laughs> my dog is jumping up on the equipment here. Um, no, he's adorable. <laughs> yeah, he'll, he's liable to step on something. But True. the um, so that's a big part. That's really one of my goals going forward is to, to have these marked for for cycling for all uses. You know, so people know that it's a it's a it's a not a maintained road, and also they know where it is. Right. And we I, I was talking with a few other attendees about that because we were just out there like, where did these come from? These signs are yes. amazing. Yeah. They're really cool. They're bright. They're clear. Yes. They're understandable. You know yeah. exactly where you're going. Because yeah. yeah, we came to a couple of spots where there's intersections and right. Like, oh, does it continue right. that way? Normally, you have to get out, double yeah. check the GPS, yeah. and no, it's right there. Exactly. It's labeled. Exactly. And there was one guy who, in addition to having the GPS, every time he took a turn, he just took a 
a photo of the intersection. Oh, nice. Right? So he was doing that on the main streets. And then yeah. he got out in the woods. He's like, I can keep doing this out here. <laughs> yeah. This is great. And totally. So he had a way easy way to backtrack. So it was, it's awesome. I really hope that that does yeah. spread throughout the state. I think, I've I think never it would be a great thing. Like it. Yeah. It's not like it's not like any other state in the union. Yeah. There's, New Hampshire's kind of similar. They have class six roads, but they're not uniformly mapped. <clears throat> the maps that are available are not geotagged like they are with VTrans. Yeah. Um, and they're uh, and they're much more concentrated in certain areas, and there's nothing elsewhere. In Vermont, they're in every town. We have class four roads in almost every single town. I can't even think of one that doesn't have one. In fact, in 2007, we proved a point. We did an expedition, a group of us, from the Canadian border to the Massachusetts border, and the only rule was every single town we crossed, we had to drive a class four road. And there was literally not once. In fact, we started on a class four road that goes right to the Canadian border, chain link fence, yep. home on the other side with a fleur de lis flag. <laughs> we were like right there, and we drove, we took pictures, touched the fence. Of course, there's cameras everywhere, of course, filming everything. <laughs> we did have a couple of suburbans follow us for a while. It was a big group. It was like 15 trucks, but we we did we did this route. It took four days, and we went all the way through the state. Of course, stopping at great restaurants along the way. We did do a lot of driving, 10 or 12 hours a day. But every single town we crossed, we did actually more than one class four road. Yep. There were a couple of them where only only one was available. But we got all the way to the Massachusetts border, and there was a big um, marker there. And it was on a class four road as well that said, it's like ancient. You like know, one of the granite like markers? 19th century or, marker, yeah. granite marker that said <laughs> Vermont, Massachusetts. It was so cool. <laughs> That's awesome. It was really cool. Yeah. And, and that's the other thing that you, you've done is just so much of that real world traveling throughout the state, oh, yeah. exploring. Yeah. And like you said, you also do the Vermont Overland Trophy. Yes. Um, and that's more of a, that's kind of like a, it's an extreme, know, it's an extreme, extreme yeah. Yeah. challenge. Event. Challenging. It's, it's kind of akin to the original Camel Trophy. That was series. the idea. The idea was to create a point to point expedition with people competing, but also helping each other. And it's a pure driving competition, unlike later camel trophies where there was more special task stuff. This right. is, or even earlier ones, this is a driving one. So we have a point system with that, two challenge sections a day. And the, the guy with the lowest points is the winner at the end of the time. And this year, we had two guys that were tied for first with one point going into our final. We had a tiebreaker route, a little challenge section, a tiebreaker route on the property here. And these guys did, which is like, it's nearly impossible to tie in that because it's, you have to get some points. So these guys each got, no, I'm sorry. They cleaned it. Each of them cleaned it uh, astonishingly. And uh, they ended up, it was Joe Safford and Ken Brown and they, both Jeep guys. And they ended up having to do yet another tiebreaker where I time trialed them through the same course. <laughs> and luckily that like one, like Ken clipped a tree. So he was a few seconds behind Joe. So, but it was pretty awesome. And again, that's our, we do have 10 spots. That's a club event because I've kept right. that really small and intimate. We have Vermont Overland Club that really promotes that and is going to hopefully do that into the future. But we've got 10 spots open for industry people. So if we've got like Rovers North wants to, wants to send a truck, right. they can send a truck down. Um, and that's, it's a little expensive to do it, but again, for the industry folks, it's a tax rate off and stuff. It's, but I, what I want that to morph into is a real testing ground for these companies that do truck builds or that do, um, really any sort of off-road motorsport. You know, if King of the Hammers wanted to send a truck down, it's gotta be road legal. Right. So they can send a truck. If Peterson's four wheel drive wants to send a vehicle, they can send a vehicle here and do the thing and even cover it. That's kind of the goal of it. I'm not sure if it's ever going to get there because it's a pretty small event, but it, it's it's an awesome event. I mean, yeah. it's like these guys, some of the driving is amazing. Steve and I have the privilege, Steve Ostrovitz, have a privilege of, of scoring that. And it's like one of the most fun things we do all year because awesome. the driving is just incredible. It's pretty awesome. And we we work with uh, the 4x4 podcast as well. We're in the same network. Right. And I believe right. that Dan Cole of the 4x4 yes. podcast came and did he, he, he covered attended. It. He yeah. attended oh, yeah. and covered it one year. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. He, he has great stories about yeah. coming out and doing That's that. Cool. And loved it. Yeah. But yeah, it's, I mean, it's amazing that you have, obviously, uh, VOR mm -hmm. is real world test of your vehicles for anybody. Yeah. But then you have the VOT, which is no, you, you and a co-pilot, you this have to in. do, this is it. This you is all go. In. Yep. So yeah, it's cool. awesome. And it's, it, you know, it's good to keep it small yeah. for that reason. Cause yes. not everybody should. Not everybody's this. cup of tea. And yeah. it's a real, it's a real proven ground. And it's really more of a wheeling event than it isn't, but it's still overlanding because 
you you have to you have to camp out of your vehicle. Everything right. you have to bring with you, and you got to be comfortable. Because I'll tell you, at the end of three days of, the, of driving eight to twelve hours a day and having the, and the stress of the competition, it's hard. Yeah, it's, it gets to be like an endurance event. Yeah, and, and when you say driving, it's this is not like eight hours of driving on the no, highway. No, it's almost or dirt all roads. Class, I literally like, string together yeah. the most densely packed areas of Class Four road, and it's like you are you are off road all day. Right. I mean, it really is what it is. Yeah, it's cool. That's awesome. <laughs> and so you do the cycle tours as yes, well? Yes, and, and actually just do races. So I've got oh, a races, really, okay. really events, so mass start events. So we've got the Vermont Overland Maple Adventure Ride, which is yeah. Maple, uh, the Maple Sugar Makers Weekend in March, late March. And that's it's actually, a lot of times we have snow on the ground, we've got ice and everything else. That's a gravel grinder, which is this new form of bicycle racing where it's open to everybody. There's no license needed. Yeah. Um, and it's got the bikes look like a ten speed bike, but they've got bigger, knobbier tires and lower gearing. Nice. So it's sort of like the shades of gray between like cyclocross and even mountain biking. The whole idea of gravel grinding too, which I which I took to so rapidly, was getting out into the you know into the back roads, and that was the whole idea. Really getting us off paved roads where it's becoming more and more dangerous to ride. Yeah, so, Vermont is horrendous. I mean, yeah, Vermont is really trying to improve the situation, right. but it tends to be yes. certain counties and totally. certain cities that are making progress. The rest of the, the state rest of it is not so much. Not safe. yeah. So we just have taken seventy percent of the roads in Vermont are dirt. Yeah. So we've just taken to the dirt. Right. So that's our that's our spring event. I do some private corporate events for rides for people. Like for Morgan Stanley, I do a great event called the Hedge Fondo. It's a play on words. We have all these major hedge fund owners, all of whom ride bikes. They love yeah. them. So they come in and they do it. That's, they're the nicest guys in the world. We have literally like $30 billion in net worth and about 50 guys here. And they're the nicest guys. And you you want to hate them, but you can't. <laughs> yeah. They're just so nice. So we do that in July. And then we have our big bike event. Oh, actually, this year, our new event was Pave Madness. So we did this thing. We call the Class 4 road pave, which is a French word for pavement. Really, what it really relates to is cobblestones. Right. So okay. like in northern France, you have these cobblestone roads that are famous in races like Paris-Roubaix or the Tour of Flanders. And we, we call this, this in, in fact, in our main event, which is in August, the Overland, we have seven sections of pave. And, uh, but we have this thing called Pave Madness, which is really, it's from the house here. It's a mountain bike event where the whole thing is on class four roads. So nice. we go over and do all these roads we're doing here at VOR, extreme stuff. I mean, rideable, but very, yeah. very technical. So that's in July as well. It's right prior to the Hedge Fondo. And then we have uh, the, the big event, which, which is this year it was 800 riders, is the Overland. Nice. So that's our event we do out of Suicide Six in late August, straight up gravel race. And that's 49 miles with about 5,500 feet of elevation gain, seven sections of pave, and it finishes coming down a ski slope at Suicide Six. So it, it, you <laughs> ride up a regular road of the gully called the Gully Road, and then you enter onto a ski slope and then ride down Milky Way, which is one of their easier slopes. Yep. And then you come right down and you finish right behind the lodge. It's wow. awesome. A huge party afterwards. Beer's flowing. The food's great. <laughs> But it's still a part. And I used to have like these two different worlds where one was biking, one was off-road. And now they're merging. Because yeah. the guys, well, I'm seeing more and more. I'm seeing guys show up in built Tacomas, built Land Rovers, LR3s, whatever, that are that are off-road capable, but they're into the biking too. Yep. And that's really cool. Yeah, I've been running into a number of those people. Yeah. Who just, yeah, into both. It's becoming it's awesome. more than the same demographic. Yeah. yeah. It's great. It is cool. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Well, thank you very much hey, for your welcome. time. Do you have anything else that you want to... Oh, this is great. I, it's, I'm sorry. You, you get me going. And once I get warmed up, I could talk forever. <laughs> no, no, same, same here. But like, I, I know we could go off on tangents. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's... Totally. Yeah, it's great. That was fun. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. It's such an awesome event. And I, I got to go out with the OEX guys yesterday, and that was just amazing. They're phenomenal. So yeah. really it's cool. really nice to have you still have that. The, they're always going to be here. As long as they're willing, they'll be here. Yeah. Yeah, it's so important. Yeah. And and you're having the, the few rules actually seems to probably counterintuitively to people who want to add more rules. It helps because Common I don't sense. see anybody going... Oh, grumble, grumble, grumble. There's no. that rule. I, I, I just want to skirt around. No, there's none of that. No. There are no rules. Common Everybody's sense. just having fun, common sense. Just a couple of things. It all just goes easily. The exactly. couple of of issues you've had, I witnessed some of them, and it's talk about it for a couple of minutes and it's That's done. it, and it goes away. Yeah. 
You just can't. There, that's a, that's kind of a lesson in life too, because so often we see in our schools, like in my kids' schools, one little thing happens, they change the rules, and everybody suffers. Right. You expect yeah. the little things to happen. If it doesn't, something's wrong there. Yep. You know, you expect to have. You know, as long as the majority of everything is is going smoothly, that's good odds. I'll take that. I'll it take is. that all day. Yeah. yeah. And this is such a diverse group too. You know, like obviously we're a Land Rover yep. podcast, but. There, you know, we have a Jeep podcast and we have the general four by four podcast yes. in our network. Yeah. We love talking about anything. Yeah. Um, and even Land Rovers, they, the first one, the center steer, which our podcast is named after that was built on a Jeep frame because right. the brothers loved exactly. just driving around this Jeep. Like exactly. everything's connected, but this is so nice to just see all types of vehicles, yeah. all types of people. Everybody gathers around. They, they merge up and go have fun. It's a little lesson in life, yeah. man, because we have extreme diversity here. Yeah. We have people here in RVs, and we've got who are, I don't even think they're going off road. Right. And then we've got people here in extreme Unimogs, you know, yeah. who, are, who, are, who are just aiming to do all the red trails, and that's all they want to do. Yeah. Everybody gets along, yeah. which is really cool. Yeah. You I, know, I, I talked awesome. to one group who went out yesterday who it was like one of every vehicle. Yeah. There was yeah. like one Land Rover, one yeah. Tacoma, one Forerunner. Uh, there was the Pinsgauer, there was like a Unimog, and it was like just one yeah. of everything. Everybody went out and they just all got to watch how every vehicle did everything differently. It's cool. But everybody got through. And everybody they got through, it. yeah. yeah. It makes it, it more interesting. Yeah, it, it really does. is cool. It's perfect. It's, it's yeah. the perfect event for Vermont. Thanks, man. I really appreciate what you've been doing for this. I'm yeah. glad I could attend again. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for doing this too. Thanks for getting the word out. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Thanks again. All righty. Five, eight, four, eight. Nine three nine five eight four eight. Big winner right there. Congratulations. Excellent. All right, that is it for the raffle. Motor Mike, back up on the hill, making funnel cakes into the evening. Do not miss out right up there by the blue. You can see him sipping more beer, more pizza, breakfast in the morning. Matt Seifel on guitar. Thank you very much for attending the 2017 Vermont Overland Rally. And that's the show for September 2017, show number 45. And that's the show for September 2017, show number 54. My dyslexia was showing. I want to thank uh, Morgan and Harold for joining me on the show today, talking about all things Land Rover. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time and contributions. Also want to thank the One True Packs for his production support, continuing production support. And also thanks to uh, Oval News and Rover Hall, the same person. Uh, we're gonna we're working to take over centersteer.com, and that's spelled in the American way, C-E-N-T-E-R.com. We're just uh, we're getting there. Uh, I need to wait for Morgan to give me some information, and then we'll get that to him to take that site over. In the meanwhile, please continue to look for us at C-E-N-T-R-E steer.com. Correct. I don't think it's been a real problem, but it's just a little nicety that we've been doing this for four and a half years. Well, for, for, for the dyslexics amongst us, it's kind of nice to... <laughs> yes, good point. ...have both. For those of us who, uh, you know, have autocomplete, change it on us every single time. See, now there's a good reason to shut off that damn autocomplete. Yep. For sure. And I also want to thank Peter again for uh, the excellent interview at the end of the Vermont Overland Rally and Jim Macri for attempting to do an, an interview recording. Uh, it's still an excellent interview. Unfortunately, the recording didn't come out. And that was at uh, British Invasion in Stowe. And of course, extra thanks to the OEX guys at Vermont, Vermont Overland Rally for their training and, and their time. That was an excellent experience. Having to Great put up guys. with you? Yes, absolutely <laughs> having to put up with me. I talked Ted's ear off for quite a while. So thank you to Ted and Don. And last but very not least, all of the new people that I met, especially Land Rover owners at the event. And there were quite a few people who actually had listened to the show. So thank you to them. Glad to meet you all in person. So, so people do listen to what we have to say. Interesting. Apparently, yeah. Uh, that might have been the last of it, though. Who knows? Well, at least we know Tom's in Norway. I know Oren's in Australia. We know the bells are still out there. Somewhere.
and I think I pushed this on the on the Twitter feed, and uh, but go out and check their video of their rebuild, by the way. The Bells did a rebuild of their 130, and you might want to check out it's a 12 minute video they put together. Very nice. Must be in very fast motion to compress that big job into 12 minutes. <laughs> yes, indeed. Absolutely. Yeah, they, they do tear down, build up, building of the box, painting, doing some interior work, putting the uh, top that goes up to two meters in height. So you get to see a lot of that, yeah. a lot of that work done. Because I can tell you, tearing a truck down to the frame and rebuilding it takes a whole lot longer than 12 minutes. Yeah, Indeed, they have it does. many months worth of work into that. They do, as they is do. somebody else. Yes, and uh, they. Uh, I told them this. I only say this in the podcast. They spelled my name wrong, but that's okay. Ugh. I know. I know. That hey, things happen. You know, they. they I was. I was at least mentioned because it was a year ago. You you, sh- you sure they didn't spell it in the South African spelling? Oh, I didn't think of that. That's a good point. Because it was a year ago, they stayed with me, and so it was very kind of them to at least mention my name in the pod in their uh, video. I hope you enjoyed the show, 54, uh, and thank you for listening to the show. Reminder to visit our website for past shows and show notes. You can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can directly support the show at www.patreon.com slash center steer. It's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and center in the British spelling, and it will be that way. We are going to investigate increasing our web hosting capacity to allow for posting of larger files and hope so we don't have to reduce the audio quality. Uh, we're going to investigate that. Also, we'd love to hear from you and what you're up to in your Land Rover. Were you born in your Land Rover? <laughs> until, until next time, I hope you share the show with one other Land Rover fan. Thanks for listening. Wave as we pass by. Wrap it up.